Good morning, everyone. My name is Jermont Chen, and I'm a program officer for the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. And on behalf of the members of NIH's Synthetic Biology Consortium, I'd like to welcome you to 2022's annual meeting. For today's meeting, we'll have some opening remarks, followed by four invited talks, and then closing remarks. After the presentation session, we'd like you to join our gather town for a virtual poster session and networking session. So we'll start off with our opening remarks. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dina Singer, NCI's Deputy Director for Scientific Strategy and Development, who will provide the opening remarks. As the NCI Deputy Director for Strategic for Strategy and Development, Dr. Singer works closely with the NCI Director and other Deputy Directors to carry out the Institute's mission. She also leads a number of key initiatives at NCI. In early 2020, she led the rapid creation of the Serological Sciences Network to expand serological testing and capacity and research to characterize the immune response elicited by the SARS-CoV-2 viral infection. So with that, we can uh, play uh, Dr. Singer's opening remarks. Thank you for inviting me to provide some remarks to this meeting of the NIH Symbio Consortium. Um, I know we're here at this meeting to consider the application of synthetic biology across all NIH uh, interests and NIH-related diseases, but I thought it might be of interest to start with some history of NCI's involvement in synthetic biology. NCI actually has a long-standing interest in synthetic biology and its application to cancer biology research in particular. In fact, we sponsored uh, the, our first synthetic biology meeting back in February of 2010. And at that time, we already had a significant commitment to another field, uh, namely the development of cancer systems biology. And we understood that synthetic biology could be a critical complement to systems biology. So while cancer systems biology aims to develop computational models that predict the behavior of cancer cells, we understood that synthetic biology could be a powerful tool for testing those computational predictions. So the goal of that original workshop was to discuss the status of synthetic biology at that time, which then was still focused primarily on creating biological machines, and use that workshop to discuss uh, how synthetic bio biology might be uh, applied in the context of systems biology. Six years later, in 2016, NCI sponsored another workshop in synthetic biology. By that time, the field had really advanced rapidly. The approaches had progressed from an almost exclusive focus on non-mammalian, mostly bacterial systems, to the re-engineering of mammalian systems. Um, for example, the early engineering of the T-cell receptor to generate CAR T-cells was already well underway. So that 2016 workshop focused on ways in which synthetic biology might integrate across the spectrum of all cancer biology research. From that original workshop in 2010 until today, uh, NCI has continued to support the development of synthetic biology through a variety of its programs and its funding mechanisms. For example, the Innovative Molecular Analysis Technologies Program, or IMAT, uh, has seen a growing portfolio in synthetic biology. Synthetic biology has been a major focus in a number of programs within the Cancer Moonshot, which has supported uh, work on engineering of immune systems for safe and e effective therapeutic applications. A new area that we're very excited about is the engineering of microbes to directly deliver therapies to tumors. So given the interests of both NCI and the NIBIB in advancing synthetic biology, partnering to form the SynBio and Cancer Program uh, was an obvious next step. That program is collaboratively supporting six awards 
that are applying cutting edge advances in synthetic biology to cancer research. The strength of this program is its multidisciplinary composition, which brings together oncologists, cancer researchers, engineers, computational scientists, and other technology developers. For those of you who attended this meeting last year, you had the opportunity to hear from investigators of that program, some of whom are in this meeting or attending again the meeting this year. So we anticipate that the project supported in the SynBio and Cancer program will serve to further integrate the approaches of synthetic biology into all aspects of cancer research, from the basic to the translational to the clinical. And given the enormous progress that's been made in the field, in cancer systems biology and in AI as well, it's perhaps not premature or unrealistic to envision that the integration of these fields will unravel the complexities of cancer in a way that we only imagine today, but is not yet possible. Today, I've focused on the integration of synthetic biology into cancer research, but synthetic biology clearly has broad applications across a large spectrum of biological systems and diseases beyond cancer. In short, this is an exciting field that has enormous potential to inform biomedical research. So I'll close by thanking Germont Chen and David Rampula from NIBIB, as well as Michelle Bernie Lang and Tony Dickerber from NCI, and the staffs from the many NIH institutes and centers who supported this meeting. I did have a chance to look at the agenda and uh, realized what an exciting meeting this is going to be. I'm really disappointed I won't be able to join you, but I do encourage you to take full advantage of the meeting, to interact with your colleagues, and most of all, to enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, thanks to Dr. Singer for providing our opening remarks. So what we will do now is move to our um, invited talks. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Domatilla Del Vecchio. Um, she is from MIT's Department of Mechanical Engineering. Her research focuses on developing techniques to make synthetic genetic circuits robust to context and applying these to biosensing and cell fate controls for regenerative medicine applications. What she'll do is provide an introduction to control theory, provide uh, her research highlights, and then she'll summarize the 30 November breakout summary that we've had prior to this meeting. So with that, I can in, we can pass the virtual mic to uh, Domatilla. Thank you very much, uh, Jomont, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, everybody, uh, for uh, inviting me here to speak to this uh, meeting. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so my first talk, uh, which I'm going to share with you, um, it's about a short introduction to the field of uh, synthetic biology, uh, mostly from a historical perspective. And then I will uh, uh, go into a little bit more introduction to uh, control design. So essentially, the goals of this talk are to introduce the field of synthetic biology, provide a critical perspective on the progress to date, and introduce the field of control system design, as I think most people here are probably not very familiar with that field. And then I will provide ideas for how control design can help advance synthetic biology. And this is, of course, uh, my personal bias. Um, so this is the disclaimer. Um, then um, I would like to start by going back to the history okay, of synthetic biology. So about 20 years ago, the first two um, engineered genetic circuits were built in bacteria. And the idea at the time of building the system was essentially to engineer small networks to understand biology. So at a high level, the way this was done 
was essentially by uh, taking plasmids from bacteria, inserting synthetic DNA, but then cones genes that we want to put in your network, and then putting back in the bacterium so that you could use the resources such as transcriptional, translational resources from the bacterium to essentially express the proteins of interest. So synthetic DNA encodes genes that express proteins that regulate the expression of other genes. So these networks have been loosely called circuits to draw the analogies to electrical engineering, but of course there is nothing circulating in the systems like currents. The key physical process that was used as a starter for the circuit is the genetic modules that provides transcription and translation, mRNA and protein, but the key point is that these modules have inputs that can either be activators or repressors. And these were used to interconnect multiple of these genetic modules together. And what I'm showing here, it's a, a ring of four repressors that was built in 2000. It's one of the first two genetic circuits by Elowitz and Liebler. And what I would like to stress is that the way the circuit were designed to begin with is writing ordinary differential equation that describe the rate of change of protein concentrations in time. And it's amazing to see that in 2000, with this approach, people were already able to engineer the circuits in bacteria. And for this case, this is courtesy of Alois. Uh, lab, you can see that the fluorescence, which correspond to the concentration of one of these proteins, is oscillating in time. So they built the first uh, engineered oscillator. So the same here, also the toggle switch, which is a bistable network appeared. And again, it was designed based on these predictive differential equation models. So what happened then in around 2010, there was a transition in the field where the uh, idea shifted from understanding biology to more programming cells for useful functionalities. And when I talk about useful functionality, I always like to show this movie. It's a natural field. It's a white blood cell chasing a bacterium in your bloodstream, which I always find as an exciting example of sensing, computation, and actuation uh, in a feedback loop. So with that, what are some of the applications that the field has been considering. So when I look at the spectrum of applications, I always like to divide them in short, medium, and long term. So in the short term, we have applications such as diagnostic, mostly using cell-free systems where you extract the cytoplasm from the cell and you reconstitute it that in a probe. Then we have biosafety and materials production. So you use the cell as a factory, and this is a long history, of course, we like on metabolic engineering. In the medium term applications, as we have heard in the previous talk, um, there are applications where engineered bacteria interface with the human body, such as in targeted drug delivery, or the engineered microbiome, about which we have been hearing a lot in the past few years. In the very long term, we are talking at this point of engineering the mammalian cell for a number of applications, such as regenerative medicines to regenerate damaged tissues or for preventing or curing a number of diseases. So what I wanted to do next is to give you an idea of today, what were some examples of great stories where uh, people were actually got really close to the field. So in the short term bucket, we have suffering diagnostic that was applied in the field just this past year, 2022. Uh, so this is a fieldable system that was used to detect Zika virus uh, from serum. And uh, the key technology here is the total switch sense and response system that allows to detect and recognize RNA targets. Uh, in 2017, uh, this was coming from the Silver Lab at Harvard. Um, they demonstrated the use of this bistable network, the toggle switch, uh, for an operating time of six months in the mice gut and showed that this can be used to record uh, the presence of biomarkers of inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a great example of engineered diagnostic microbes that were tested in mouse models. And then for the long-term application, there is one example here from 2017. This is courtesy of the Lou Lab, where therapeutic mammalian circuits were tested on cancer mouse models. 
And the key scene bio technology here was a classifier of RNA signatures that could recognize the presence of cancer cells and release agents to educate T cells to target them. So, but that said, how are the circuits designed? So there is an exciting vision that was faced in 2006 for the approach to design of the systems. And the thought was program cells like we do with computers. Of course, that was a very futuristic reason. And people were really thinking of starting from physical parts, assembling into gates, modules, systems, networks, right? All the way from lower level to high level. Why was this vision so powerful at the very beginning? Because this really allowed to create a system by composing simple subsystems. This simplifies design, and this somehow allows to forget the details within a subsystem when you compose it with other parts. And here is an example from 2012 from the Voigt lab, the first author is Moon, who is in this meeting, uh, who essentially designed an 11 gene circuit of three layers. And that's a great example of how increased scale was becoming possible and is becoming possible. Um, so uh, that's supported also by the speed at which we can read and write uh, DNA. And that's also supported by the recent uh, appearance of design automation software that allow to come up with a design and find an implementation. Uh, cells mostly for bacteria and has been pretty uh, and it's working on mammalian cells. So this was the vision in 2006. What's the vision today? Well, today the vision is challenging, it's changing. And I thought to give you a sense of why is it changing. So when we design these circuits, we are realizing that we still need a way to compose parts such that we achieve predictable outcomes. So when components operate together in the cell, they often become unpredictable. Even if you're thinking of using what in our mind is input-output connection, it turns out that these systems have a lot of connectivity with the cellular background. Failures, therefore, are very difficult to debug because they're not due to direct interactions, but through interactions that go through the cell. And small changes in lab cognition can disrupt circuit function, pH, uh, growth, uh, temperature. The result of this is that we can definitely create larger circuits, but when a new component is added to a system, all existing parts typically need to be redesigned or retuned. And this means that for a circuit with 11 genes, it takes a PG thesis of five to six years to complete it. So the strict analogy to computer engineering, uh, it's failing in practice. So in electrical systems, components are designed to be insulated from external influences through two main mechanisms. One is physical separation, and the second is negative feedback, which I'll talk about later. In biology, the components that we use are just not engineered for insulation. That's not the way nature designed them, but we often use them as if they were. So, why can't we achieve predictable outcomes? Uh, so engineered genetic systems depend on the context. So context affect a genetic device that you can imagine you're going to insert in the chromosome of your mammalian cell in many ways. First of all, genetic context matters. So the activity and the reaction of surrounding genes around your uh, engineered parts are changing the rate, for example, in which your genes are being expressed. And we know very well the chromatin state of surrounding logi is affecting a lot the way genes are expressed from this green part. Cellular context also matters. There are off-target interactions with the cell that are often difficult to predict beforehand. Uh, there is resource sharing. So these genetic circuits are using cellular resources to function. And then there is growth effects. So they are affecting the rate at which the cells is dividing. And then of course there is cell state. Furthermore, if you look at what's outside the cell, there is all this extracellular environment that may include other cells, changes in nutrient, temperature, pH, uh, cell cell signaling, and the cell niche. The good news is that in the past five to six years, there have been a number of papers that have been trying to pinpoint and dissect one by one each one of the uh, sources of variability. But the key question is really, to what extent shall we create predicting models of each one of these dependencies versus make design that are robust 
to this effect. So when I talk about robustness, I always like to show what we mean by robustness in engineering. So in transition engineering fields, we use control system design to make outcomes robust to effects that we don't model and we didn't predict in advance. So this is the Boston Dynamics dog, and it's one of the most celebrated current examples of how you can design complex, robust systems. So then what is control system design? So it's a collection of tools and techniques for analyzing, designing, and implementing complex systems in the presence of uncertainty. So it's a combination of dynamics, interconnection, mainly through feedback and feed forward, communications, computing, and software. And there are essentially two key principles uh, in control system design. The first principle is that feedback is a tool for managing uncertainty in the system and in the environment. There is no uncertainty, most likely you shouldn't bother in designing feedback. The second principle is that feedback and feedforval are tools for designing dynamics, the integration of sensing, actuation, and computation. And as a result, you can essentially isolate your system from influences that you um, uh, don't like. So there are some ex celebrated examples of applications of feedback to make systems robust. And the one I always like to make is what happened in the 1920s with the telephone line was supposed to connect the West with the East Coast in the United States. The way people were designing it was to put a set of amplifiers in a series in order to avoid signal attenuations through such a long distance. The problem is that amplifiers are susceptible to noise have distortions and are very fragile in general to environmental changes. So um, Pars Black came and said, uh, don't worry about making better amplifiers, Get, just put a negative feedback around them. You reduce the amplification gain, but you make this gain robust to the environment. And that's actually how um, the first telephone line connecting the two coasts was enabled. The interesting thing is that it took him 10 years before you could patent these ideas because people were very skeptical. That said, this principle has been used all over, for example, to allow repeatable performance of amplifiers with large parameter uncertainty. And it's also critical for enabling stability of intrinsically unstable systems. So feedback control system standard model is essentially this one. So if you open a textbook, this is what you will see. You have the process, uh, you have sensing, and sensing is essentially taken uh, from your controller, which then it's going to compensate by actuating the process for all the disturbances and uncertainty that you have around your process. Uncertainty can include parameter uncertainty, disturbances, and noise. So uh, an example of that is the cruise control system. So here is an autonomous vehicle from the Caltech DARPA Grand Challenge team. Uh, so cruise control is using integral control and make sure that you can keep the same speed independent of variation in the environment, such as the slope of the road or the weight of the vehicle. So what are the advantages of feedback? Um, design of dynamics, increased robustness to uncertainty, and insulation. So modularity and interoperability. There are these advantages though, such as risk for instability, noise amplification, uh, the complexity, which is especially problematic if you think about how you design this in cells, as you can have added burden. And it's sensitive to uncertainty in this blue feedback path. So going back to our context dependence issue of genetic circuit. So if I translate this biological view of the problem into a more system view where I take my synthetic genetic device and I start writing down carefully all the interactions that um, uh, affect them uh, with respect to the cellular context, other genetic devices, chromatin state, I can loosely regard context dependence as an issue of lack of robustness to environmental uncertainty. So in this way, that essentially becomes conceptually a classical control system design problem, but with notable differences, uh, especially extent of uncertainty in biology is much larger, uh, stochasticity, which we don't have as much in engineering, and lack of precise components that is definitely the case when we design genetic circuits. But that said, this view has, is somehow explaining the increasing trend that we have seen in the past several years of uh, synthetic biology 
and control design intersections where we have been seeing an increasing number of um, control theory applications in synthetic biology, mostly to ensure robustness. And in the past four to five years, there were the first works done for mammalian cells. Especially in these works, the view has been the following mostly. So you have your genetic device in your mammalian cells that you are engineering, and it's taking regulatory inputs, but it's also being affected by perturbation that may change the transcription rate, translation rate. You may have non-specific targeted interactions, and all of this can be regarded as disturbance. So you have this set of disturbances that you are affecting your device, and then you have either the ability to design feedback control or feed forward control. But the overall result is that when the disturbance is hitting your system, the device output should be able to adjust to that perturbation and essentially go back to the nominal behavior. So um, in 2020, there were the first two feed forward controllers uh, to make gene expression robust to cellular resource variability and cell state changes. One was from our group at, at MIT, uh, was an endoribonucleus based feed forward controller. The other was from ADH, from the Camasius group was a microRNA-based feedback controller. And then in 2022, there were the first two feedback controllers to make gene expression regulation robust to a number of perturbations, including cellular resource variability, non-specific microRNA targeting, and noise. Uh, uh, one was done by implementing integral controllers, which I'll tell you more later, through uh, phosphorylation. And the second one was using sRNA, mRNA interactions. But with that, um, so what's next, right? So what I've been talking mostly about is a scale of control at the single gene level. But the reality is that if we look ahead, right, we may think of the scale of genetic control going to networks, and tissues and cell populations, right? And what are the applications of controlling precisely, right, quantities, uh, such as concentrations of transcription factors? There are several applications in regenerative medicine and therapeutics from autonomous self-fate programming, right? Where you essentially carefully um, uh, express given transcription factors uh, in time. And then uh, applications such as in vivo homing and population control, for example, for uh, tumor containment. But there are notable challenges for control system design that I need to mention, which we'll hear more when I summarize the breakup sessions, uh, is the extent of the environment uncertainty, noise, and the lack of precise components. But that takes me to the end of my talk. I would like to thank very much Deborah Pula and German Chen for allowing me to share with you the results of our funding agency. Richard Murray, who contributed uh, some materials to this talk, as well as Nika Shabiga, Shakiba and Ross Jones, who also contributed some materials. Thank you. So thank you so much, you know, Domitila, in the wonderful talk. I mean, we discussed, you know, during breakout session, I mean, multiple different things. But I wanted to ask your perspective or insight for the you know next 20 years. I mean, you already kind of mentioned something, but to me, I mean, the most important thing in synthetic biology, we already done a lot last 20 years, but now it's time to deliver some near world application product. And then can you share some insight you thinking about? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll probably be talking more about it in the next talk, but to give you a sense, I think the examples and just few selected examples that I gave at the very beginning show that we are really close, I think, in many ways. So I think moving forward, we may have to restrict probably the scope of what we are doing at the time, putting more constraints so that our problem are more well-defined and we can reduce a lot of the uncertainty that we think we have to deal with, but perhaps we shouldn't for the specific applications and setup that we envision. Also, some follow-up question is, I mean, you know, you already mentioned a lot of great things. Also, thank you for mentioning my work, but I still believe now, at that time, I believe the complex circuit is better, but now, now believe simpler, the better, because I mean, 
adding one more circuit element that giving burden. So there are some, you know, some we need to kind of compromise in some point or optimize because edit edit, you know, circuit giving a lot of burden. So could you kind of comment on simplicity and complexity? I mean, in terms of application, you know, in the future. Uh, so that's a great question, and I think I have one slide on that for the breakout summary, uh, okay. essentially stemming from our conversation. So perhaps we can um, uh, defer to that. But sure. yeah, there are trade offs. So I have one more question in the chat. Uh, why stick with the electronic circuits model with its limitation? When we making use of neural nets, uh, that do not have limitations on their feedback. Have we such a look at this alternative? I mean, that's a fantastic question. And I think that's one of the key points that were made uh, in the breakout sessions. So in fact, I personally believe that the strict analogy to electrical engineering, uh, it's not right, uh, even though I am an electrical engineer by background. So I think we need something different. Yeah. Okay. So if there are any other uh, questions, I can um, uh, share my screen for actually uh, the research talk and the um, uh, breakout uh, presentation. Um, so here it is. Okay. So um, the title of our breakout session was Engineering Biology Capabilities and Bottlenecks. And what I will do in this talk is give the first half being a research presentation on some related work that we have been doing, especially at the crossroads of synthetic biology and control system design, to give you a sense of what potential capabilities are. And then I will go to the breakout summary, where actually a lot of the questions that I got just asked were brought up, and so we'll have more chance to discuss them. So here is a disclaimer again. And so what's the outline of this talk? So I will spend about 25 minutes uh, to give you uh, a sense of what are our efforts on context-aware mammalian synthetic biology using control design. And then about 15 minutes to summarize the breakup summary on capabilities and bottlenecks in the field. And then uh, probably we'll have five or more minutes uh, for questions. So um, here's a slide that I presented before. So synthetic genetic circuits, we know are affected by their environment. And in order to make this notion a little bit more precise, I decided to give you some concrete examples on an issue that has been studied by several groups in more details, especially in bacteria and more recently in mammalian cells. So that's the issue of uh, resource sharing. So um, here's an example of an end gate uh, that uh, can be constructed. It doesn't matter if it's bacterial or mammalian, although this data is for bacterial systems. So an end gate, uh, put simply, um, this should give an eye output when the two inputs are present. And a very simple way to build it uh, is to have these two small signaling molecules, each enabling one activation step and then to cascade these two activation steps such that only when you have both the signaling molecules, the output is going to be high. It's a very simple design. These are experimental transfer curves of each one of these modules separately. But when you put them together and you do a first quick experiment, this is how it looks like. It's the opposite. And this is just to show that this is a very uh, common outcome. You create a model, you compose things, and the first experiment doesn't work. And so you have to go back and check why it's not working. So in this case, what was wrong is that between the two activations is creating some subtle between. So if you think about this thing, Whenever the first input is being applied, you have the resources of the cell that are being used, such as RNAP and ribosomes, to produce the first purple gene. But when that happens, less of these resources are available in the second stage. And so what you actually see in the full system, you don't see the expected behavior, but you actually see a decreasing trend. So that's one example of how not accounting for the cellular context can lead you to make the wrong prediction. So of course, these failures, especially related to what was asked before about resource sharing, 
uh, become more likely as the scale of the circuit increases. Uh, so this is an example of logic gates for self-free diagnostic, uh, where we had two um, layered uh, M gates, uh, so with four input molecules, which are RNA. So we are using the toehold switch technology here to detect the uh, signature of mRNA. So you have essentially the first end gate here with the two inputs, uh, inputting its output in the second end gate. So um, if you look at the just one of the two end gates, let's say gate two, uh, what you can see is that it works very nicely when gate one is not present, uh, which is shown by this first data. But when you add gate one, the gate two output is not really distinguishable when you have the input stimuli. And parsing what went wrong in the system, essentially the RNA polymerase, this is a cell-free system. There's a limited amount pool, right, of RNA polymerase that is there. And therefore, the gate one was essentially taking a lot of it and not leaving much for gate two to work. So that said, in the past years, I mostly present my work, but I have to mention that characterizing resourcing mammalian cells has been done also by other labs uh, in the United States and in Europe. And then I'll present from feedback and FIFORA controllers uh, for isolation from intracellular context. So here's to give an example of how sharing resources among genetic modules that you construct in mammalian cells uh, can impact your circuit performance. Here is a simple experiment that we have done where you have uh, a constitutive uh, green protein here, module one. And then in module two, we are activating this red protein by a synthetic transcriptional activator that you typically construct by uh, fusing a DNA binding domain, in this case, GAL4, to an activation domain, which takes care of recruiting uh, transcriptional co-activators. And of course, you have binding sites for the uh, DNA binding uh, GAL4 protein here. So uh, what happens is that once we induce the module two, so we are applying the activator to produce output two, what we see on the green is that the mRNA drops by almost 94% uh, for the case where we use one of the strongest activation domain here. And that's correlated with what you see in the protein output. So that's telling one one first thing is that there are some transcriptional resources that are being taken away from module one when we are activating the output of module two. I want to mention as an aside, this is different from what happened in bacterial cells. In bacterial cells, we have demonstrated that transcriptional resources are not a bottleneck, uh, although uh, translational resources are the major bottleneck. So uh, we did a number of experiments to characterize what happens if you have the DNA binding sites for your activator or not. There isn't much of a change here, which means that uh, the DNA binding is not necessary for creating this uh, uh, competition effects. And what you can notice here is that the activation domain alone uh, leads to resource sequestration. So transcriptional co-activators are likely resource competed for. And if you trace this back in the literature from the 90s, you probably can pinpoint that the mediator is one of the culprits here. So that allowed us to create a simple biophysical model uh, to um, rework the traditional Hill function base model that is used for uh, genetic circuit design uh, that essentially just includes the conservation law of this transcriptional co-activator. And what's predicting is essentially that if you have an activator, the on-target regulatory function actually becomes sign undetermined. It should be an activation, but in reality, you could see a repression. And any activator is going to become an effective repressor from anything else. So if you look back at experimental uh, data, and you plot the green and the red here, uh, what you will see is that especially as you increase the strength of the activation domain, uh, you are going to see much more severe effects, which is what the model is predicting, as you can see from the trace here, as you decrease the dissociation constant of the binding. But that said, what it's important to notice that these effects are not specific to a promoter, activation domain, and cell lines. 
We have done a library of promoters for your module one, activation domain for your module two, and we have tested this in a bunch of different cell lines. And we always see that, as you can uh, see here from the purples, that we have significant competition of resources in most of the combinations. So this is really banging the question, do we have a way to make genetic modules uh, robust to resource variability? And this is a lead way on part of my talk, which is uh, feedback for our controllers for isolations of gene expression from intracellular context. So the view that we are taking here uh, is one where we have our genetic device that is taking as input, for example, transcription factors, is giving as output your protein of interest. But then there are a number of perturbations here that hit your system, for example, changes in available transcription of co-activators, or changes in the level of microRNAs that change uh, the half-life or your mRNA that you weren't expecting. Bottom line, what these perturbations that you aren't expecting are changing the output level of your system. So how uh, can you uh, prevent this from happening? So there are essentially two key principles that you can use. Uh, one is negative feedback control, which is uh, taking the output and using it uh, in order to compensate for any influence of the disturbance on the genetic device. So essentially it's changing either transcription rate or translation rate in your genetic device to make sure that uh, you keep a nominal behavior despite uh, these perturbations are hitting the system. The second one is uh, feed forward control. Uh, where you have your genetic device. And in this case, you should have a way to indirectly sense the uh, disturbance of your system, which could be, for example, a resource, sharing, a resource uh, change. And if you can do that, you can compensate on the output for that defect. So what I will show you is that if these two systems are well designed, it doesn't matter what you pick, but what you should see here is that the system is going to adapt, okay, to the perturbation that was initially uh, causing a big change. So I will start with uh, feedback control and to give you an idea of what is one of the uh, key players when we talk about disturbance attenuation, it's integral control. Um, so what is integral control doing? Uh, so you have your genetic device, same setup, and what the controller is doing is applying an actuation to your genetic device that could either change, for example, transcription rate or translation rate. But the extent of this actuation, uh, it's not dependent on the error between your output and a desired reference, but is dependent on the integral of the error. So it's comparing your output with the desired reference. It doesn't depend on the disturbance. It's integrating that error over time and then it's actuating the genetic device with that effort. So um, under a number of conditions such as constant perturbations and uh, stability of the closed loop system, you can prove that um, at steady state, the output Y is going to be completely independent of D. So that's adaptation. And this is actually what's being used in the um, automatic cruise control of your vehicle. If you want to set the desired speed, let's say 50 miles per hour, so that's your reference input that you want to pick. Y is going to be your output speed. And then Z is going to be this uh, effort that the, uh, uh, the vehicle is making to keep up uh, that speed. And that doesn't depend on the slope changes or the weight of the vehicle. So this is uh, one of the two equations that I will have in this talk uh, that trying to explain you why this works. Um, so the effort of your system Z, if you write a differential equation for that, um, you have that that's equal to KV minus Y. And so this is your genetic device being actuated by Z and subject to disturbance D. But at steady state, when all the rate of changes of your molecular concentrations are zero, then you have that y is equal to b. And so that means that your output is going to be independent of the disturbance, okay? 
So essentially, if you want to make this work in biology, uh, you want to uh, come up with a molecular process that can compute the difference between uh, two molecular concentrations and integrate it in time. So uh, what we have shown is that this can be achieved by covalent modification cycles. Um, in particular, uh, this is showing an implementation that uh, we um, have been working on in the past several years, where you essentially are engineering a feedback by having your output of your system activate a phosphatase that deactivates the activator. So when you increase Y, you have less X star, and here you have your negative feedback. The input here, it's a kinase, which is instead regulating this forward transition. I want to show that this system is implementing an integral action, uh, which is very interesting because you can simply see that by uh, basic enzyme kinetics. So if you write for the rate of change of X star, which is essentially your actuation here, your Z, you'll see that uh, you have the nickel enzymatic form for uh, the forward and the backward reactions. And if this enzymatic reactions work in the zero order regime, then you get your nice integral controller where the rate of change of X star is just proportional to the error between your output and your input V here that doesn't depend on the disturbance. So at steady state, when the X star and the T is zero, you will have that your output is just proportional to your input and is completely independent of D. And this is supported by simulations that show the input to output relationship in the open loop system, meaning when this feedback is broken, when you have the disturbance, you have a big change, but when you have the closed loop system, the disturbance is essentially not affected your transfer curve. So uh, with that, of course, that's math, but how do you implement it? So we wanted to implement this in mammalian cells, of course. So we extracted a two-component signaling system from bacteria. That's the MZ on part pair. Uh, that's actually a system where the enzyme is uh, bifunctional. So it works both as a kinase and as a phosphodase. So it took us about a year uh, with the help of uh, Michael Lau, he's an expert of phosphorylation at MIT, to make mutations to these enzymes so we could extract exclusive kinase and exclusive phosphodase activity. Um, and this is just to show you this exclusive kinase and phosphodase activities here. Uh, and finally, we also wanted a way to tune the feedback strength. So what we did, we added a degradation tag, essential degradation domain here to our phosphodase, which we could modulate externally by a small molecule. So that said, here is the full feedback system that we assembled in hex cells. Um, so we have our output here is the blue protein. To engineer the feedback, we 2,8 linked to that, the um, phosphodase here that is engineering this negative feedback by dephosphorylating on par back to the unphosphorylated version. And the input is our kinase. Of course, we had to add binding site for the on par in order for it to bind the way our promoter, which is a minimal CMB promoter. And we also needed to add activation domain. The key thing is that we wanted to see if we could hit the systems with a bunch of perturbations that change the transcription, the translation rate, and still keep our input output transfer curve unchanged. What are the perturbations that we engineer? First of all, we um, uh, overexpressed a transcriptional activator, which we have seen is sequestering transcriptional resources. So it's decreasing the trans transcription rate. And secondly, we also expressed a microRNA in the system that could target the mRNA. So this could simulate the case where you are working in a cell line that you didn't know has uh, some microRNAs that are interacting uh, with your circuit. So I'll show you in, for the interest of time, results only for this um, GAL4 BPR perturbation. So on the left-hand side here, I'm going to show the full change of the output uh, when you are adding this perturbation that is decreasing the transcription rate of your system. You can see that the closed loop system has a very small full change while the open loop has 
um, uh, a substantial uh, change here. So that's a log scale of the output. And then um, just for the sake of comparison, I'm plotting here the open loop and the closed loop transfer curves uh, with and without the perturbation. So you can see that the open loop transfer curve is changing a lot once you're adding your disturbance, but the closed loop transfer curve is um, uh, pretty much constant. Um, I also want to point out that um, we talked about noise, uh, that this uh, feedback control system is also uh, having a noise reduction property. And you can see that here, if you look at the distribution across the cell population of your BFP level here, so it's shown by this for the open loop system. When you have the closed loop system, you can see that these distributions are much tighter, showing essentially a reduction of cell to cell variability. So why noise reduction is so important? So I want just to give you one example of how we are using this noise reduction property. Uh, it's an example in the context of reprogramming um, fibroblasts to pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so here I'm showing you the transfer curve of a standard docs inducible reprogramming system that it's used uh, frequently in the literature to reprogram fibroblasts to iPSCs. And uh, you can see that as you increase docs, right, we have a big spread here of distribution that's cell to cell variability, so it's noise. But if you do a number of experiments to try to figure out what is the range of OX4 that we should express, you find out that it's a small range, actually, that gives you the most output, uh, meaning the mostly, most reprogrammed cells. And that's this OX4 medium range here. So now the question, if you look at this plot, is what docs uh, shall we use here? It's not clear, right, to get this range. So if you change the system to include negative feedback, you go from this transfer curve to this transfer curve that shows a much less variability, right, of the expression level for each dox value. And from here, it's pretty clear what dox induction level you should use to have hold your cell population have an expression uh, range, which is within the desired range. So which hopefully will result in uh, increased um, uh, efficiency. Um, so this is hopefully going to be uh, available on bioarchives soon. So the second part uh, is um, the second principle I just want to tell you briefly about is feed forward control. So feed forward control is especially useful if you want to keep a constitutive promoter expression level constant as opposed to a transfer curve, which we have done with feedback. So here's the setup. You have your genetic device, and then you have a disturbance, which again, for the sake of explanation, I'm assuming it's um, a reduction of uh, resources required for transcription uh, due to uh, use of them by other modules. Uh, so here it's my unregulated device, and here is the regulated device. So in the regulated the device where we engineer the feed forward controller that has been done by taking the same promoter as your output and using that to express an endoribonuclease, which is designed to target a site on your mRNA. So how does this work? So if shared resources drop, uh, the output here is going to drop, but also the endoribonuclease level is going to drop which is going to result in a derepression, right, of translation, which is going to compensate for your output. And in fact, uh, if you take uh, one experimental example of this, so uh, we see that uh, for the unregulated system, as you increase the loading on resources again by overexpressing the strong transcriptional activator, you see that the output drops by quite a bit, but for the regulated system, it stays uh, fairly constant. So uh, that's showing robustness to changes in uh, transcriptional resources. Um, but one interesting question is that these shared cellular resources really depend on the cell state. And actually, the cell state dictates the concentration of many other molecular species that may affect right, the level of your output protein here. So what we decided to do is to um, consider a situation where 
uh, we implemented uh, the both the unregulated and regulated system across common cell lines used in mammalian synthetic biology because our hypothesis was that because of this feed forward controller, the expression level of our output should be more consistent across the lines. Of course, this is especially important if you're using your expression system to provide the given expression in, for example, differentiation task where your cell type is going to change among different ones. So here's the data. On the left hand side, you have the unregulated system. Uh, where you can see here on the uh, y, on the x axis the uh, level of expression uh, in a reference line hex cells and here all the other cells so you can see how the regulated system has a much higher correlation of expression level across cell types so that's really showing that uh, FIPORA control insulates gene expression from variable intracellular environment and what I would like to add on top of that is not just the gene expression level that is robust, but it's the ability to reject perturbations in that specific cell line, uh, such as changes in uh, transcriptional cofactor, which is shown here. So the performance of the feed forward controller is essentially maintained across all the cell lines. Um, so that's essentially um, uh, reaching uh, the end of the uh, research part of my talk. Uh, so uh, one key message is that cell state generally intended affects genetic modules, and these modules in turn affect back cell state through many effects, such as availability of shared resources, um, uh, cell type uh, specific markers, such as microRNA, which we know very well may have of targeted interactions with your circuit component and growth rate. I've shown you two principles, uh, negative feedback control and feed forward control. I've shown you mostly my work and actually the work of my two superstar students that now graduated and went on uh, with life, uh, both in a postdoc position right now. And uh, with that, I will pause for a few seconds before I can go to the what's next, which is the emerging discussion teams from the breakout sessions. Um, so um, I can probably go through these discussion things and then I can take questions at the end on the overall picture. Okay, so um, this talk is, I think, a good lead way in what were the emerging discussion things on essentially the two topic areas that we consider. So the first topic areas is what are the capabilities of engineering biology today? And especially if you look back historically, right, since 2000, uh, what has changed in our ability to quantitatively predict system behavior? Uh, and what can we learn from biology to design more robust, repeatable, and accurate systems in the face of uncertainty? We know biology is really good at that. So the second topic area instead was more focused on the bottlenecks. Uh, so what are the bottlenecks to make engineer cells usable for therapeutics or for basic discovery? And what can we reuse or adapt from other engineering fields? And I've given you some examples in this talk on control system design, but as people already put in the chat, there may be others that we should probably consider. So what I will do, I will start with uh, uh, topic area one and uh, we'll move from there. So one of the first emerging themes in topic area one was the key question, how much shall we know about the environment and the circuit for doing genetic circuit design? And here, right, again, I put this picture to give you a sense of all the um, uh, effects, right, that can impact your genetic device. So the questions are, what information do we require on the engineer part behaviors, uh, information on the environment, such as the cell context, what organ, what tissue, what cell type, how delivery methods affect performance. So we know that delivery via plasmid, AAV, or CRISPR affects very differently the Outcome. 
be considered in the design phase. Um, then uh, the question is uh, clear definition of the, the, the design spec of the problem. Uh, what do we need to achieve? What is it supposed to work? Uh, we need to narrow down the scope and make it application specific perhaps. Uh, for how long is it supposed to operate, days versus months? Um, input output interfaces with the environment, like host circuit interaction, cellular burden, and to what extent, right, models exist of all these effects, whether or shall we design systems that make behavior robust to this? So then the first theme was really about knowledge. Do we have enough knowledge in order to engineer reliable behavior? So the second thing that emerged was very interesting was about uh, constitutive laws that we can use for understanding and for design. When I talk about constitutive laws, I like to give the example of what I teach in one of my dynamics courses at MIT. Uh, so whether we are talking about electrical systems, fluidic systems, or mechanical systems, every component has a very precise constitutive law that correlates the key quantities such as current and voltage, pressure and volume flow rate, and et cetera. And then we have force balance that we use to put everything together and come up with the differential equation that describes the full system dynamics, which can be complex, but we can describe it. So are there any such constitutive laws that we can use in biology? Is gene expression, maybe enzyme kinetics? And here I put the picture of uh, the cover of this uh, very famous book by Kirscher and Jarrett about the plausibility of life. And they talk about evolution, but the key um, uh, concept in this book that I remember most is core processes, right? So evolution has generated these core processes that are then linked to these weak regulatory linkages depending on the specific setup. And so perhaps there are right core processes and fundamental laws that we can learn right from evolution. And indeed, linked to that, right, we have that um, evolution um, uh, as optimized design for robustness maybe, but uh, we are trying to do that in the course of a five year uh, time of a PhD in the lab. Uh, evolution took obviously much longer than that. Um, flexibility seems to be another uh, principle that nature is using, promiscuity and crosstalk that we often tend to regard as negatives in design probably nature is exploiting them in a smart way. Um, complexity and redundancy are also used by natural system and also by many engineering systems, but it's not quite clear yet how those could be engineered in uh, synthetic biology. And then of course, the field of metabolic network and especially metabolic control analysis, flux balance, flux balance analysis uh, is very old and there was a lot of progress done there. So maybe there is some principles and mechanisms that we can go back and extract from there. So in topic area one, um, the um, uh, other, uh, I would say important, uh, of course, theme was robustness, uh, as you have been hearing a lot, at least in my talk. The definition of robustness is often not clear. It's critical when we talk about robustness to define robustness of what and robustness to what. So maybe in a system, not everything must be robust uh, to everything, right? There may be some nodes that are most critical and there may be some perturbations that are most critical. Um, the other notion that came out is that uh, genetic circuits are just not built for robustness from the start, but we have um, uh, essentially uh, a notion that robustness to environmental unknowns is typically considered post-mortem after you have built the system. So perhaps robustness should be built in the design process from the start. And then there's also the notion that robustness is an emergent property. And we have many examples for sure um, uh, in biology, temperature control in humans, and sadly cancer homeostasis, where there are several nested uh, feedback loops. And of course, I always like to show uh, the Boston Dynamics dog, which I think is a great example of robustness in engineering. Um, 
So um, regarding topic area two, um, there were um, uh, interesting things coming out. Uh, so that were uh, revolving around the two key questions. Uh, what bottlenecks we have today that impede concrete application of mammalian cytotoxic biology, either for therapeutics or for discovery, for basic discovery, right? Build to understand approach. And what can we reuse or adapt from other engineering fields? So one of the main themes, of course, uh, in area two is this issue of the environment, right? Of your circuits. Um, so there is a notion that design tools and parts do not often generalize from model organisms and lab situation to the real world and the field. So the question is, uh, shall we create tools for each organism and application, or are we hoping to create general tools that apply everywhere? Um, delivery methods was the one big, um, uh, I would say, uh, ubiquitous theme here um, regarding the efficiency that varies greatly based on the organism uh, and the method actually, um, but they affect genetic constant function uh, to a great extent. And low efficiency typically means low copies, and low copies means high noise and therefore less predictability. So there was a question of uh, uh, complexity, right? How complex you want to build your circuit. Um, if you decrease right, the size of your circuit and you maybe go to low copy numbers, uh, for example, for your DNA, you do single copy integration, uh, that's favoring um, burden, right? So you have less metabolic burden on the cell, but then you have higher stochasticity on the other hand. So there are different design challenges that come into picture. And then of course, there is one recurring theme, which is about epigenetics. Uh, which can completely shut down, right? Uh, your circuit operations, well, we know very well, right? In pluripotent stem cells, if you have an inducible gene at some point that goes off, it's really hard to reactivate it. So, and then there is the ability to predict behavior across contexts is limited. So different cell lines, model versus not model organisms, different delivery methods, and also different insertion types may result in different behaviors. Five minutes to Q&A. Um, so then the second emerging theme was uh, critical differences with classical engineering systems. And I think this picture, I think, summarizes what people felt. It's probably one of the most critical differences. So um, in engineering, right, so if we look at parameter uncertainty, we think of 5x parameter uncertainty to be a large uncertainty. But biology is very messy. And if you look at the Michael Alowitz view of the cell, like a burrito, well, it's really a mess. And 5x parameter uncertainty would probably be a dream in that context. Also, there is a notion that um, a lot of times engineering systems, mostly in aerospace, I have to say, they tend to work in highly controlled situations. For example, the shuttle is launched only if the methodological conditions are favorable. Mutations? is something that is um, happening and it's an enemy of an engineer. Of course, we don't have that in engineering. Uh, it's almost as if you are programming your computer and all of a sudden you have a demon that is changing the lines in your code, right? So that's not happening, uh, uh, likely. likely. Delivery of genetic circuit can affect circuit function. That's a dominant team. Redundancy will be great, but cargo size is limited. And then engineering systems are built with robustness in mind. Uh, this way of designing biology is not currently favored. So there is a feeling that that's a little bit biased against by the reward systems of journals and funding agencies. And then there's a lot of noise in the literature. Uh, so there are a lot of unreproducible experiments. It's always very difficult to find uh, sometimes in the SI, right? How that experiment was carried. So what do we do moving forward? Define better the environment is probably one key important thing. So define better the design specs and the potential interactions. Design the genetic system with robustness in mind from the start. Design tools that are context aware from the start. And define better the design specs related to time of operation regarding to sources of uncertainty that are really important to consider and those that are not. And 
we really need models for processes in the mammalian cells that account for context when relevance and quantitative prediction of system behavior in conditions defined by the applications are generally missing, right? So beyond uh, model systems. And then delivery methods. We need effective ways to integrate large carcass in all cells. We need effective ways to introduce designs to desired locations like targeted delivery. So that's reaching the end. So at this point, I think I will open uh, for questions. So we have a few questions in the chat and I know uh, Ross has been answering some of them. So um, if no one has their hand up, um, we, can, we can start with some of the questions in the chat. Um, the first one, I always had a query that how particular promoter sequence enhances reporter signals and how some of them suppress. Okay. Um, so you mean, are you asking about the promoter sequence to level of gene expression? So is, is that the question? Yes, I think the, the person. Okay. That put, oh, put I, I see. So yes, yeah, so in my talk, what I've shown is that we have tried a large number of promoter libraries, um, uh, constitutive promoters. And what we saw is that, um, there is a great variability actually of the same promoter. So it's the same exact genetic sequence, but if you try it across different cell lines, um, which, which was, I think, uh, very interesting. Uh, and that goes back, I think, to, um, I think some data that I showed uh, before here. Um, so same promoters, different cell lines, uh, very different expression levels. So that's why I think sequence to function is not a given. So it depends on the context. Okay, so are there, uh, let's see, I'll open the chat. Um, so oh, the, the second one is wind up is often a challenge with integral control. Can you talk about how you will address wind up for integral control in synthetic biology? Okay, so that's a fantastic question. Uh, so I don't think that I've seen anything yet that addresses that uh, uh, in uh, synthetic biology. Uh, something that I have to mention um, is that um, it's going to be application specific. Um, so there may be situations where you're going to have um, integrated wind up if you really need a large actuation. But I think that a lot of times you can essentially gain more control gain by tuning the internal parameters so that you avoid essentially uh, to hit the saturations. But that's a fantastic question and, and that's open. Okay, and this one's been answered kind of back and forth in the chat. Um, very nice work. Does feedback control require more precise engineering compared to negative feedback? Um, so feed forward control, uh, yes. So for example, that's one of the downsides. So as an example, um, in the feed forward control here, uh, one key requirement for um, this to work is that the promoters are exactly the same between your target gene and the uh, controller part, because you need to make sure that they are hit in exactly the same way by the perturbations. You don't have this constraint uh, in feedback control, essentially. Yeah. Okay. What is the dynamic range of the controlled system with respect to the uncontrolled system for both strategies? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that you always have is that anytime you add feedback, you always decrease expression level, but you can compensate for that by increasing, for example, the promoter strengths or by increasing uh, translation rates. So as an example here, I didn't show much detail. Um, so to compare unregulated and regulated system, uh, you see that the level is fairly similar, but that's essentially uh, obtained by uh, essentially changing the, the translation rate, right, of your ERN and compensating 
the level with copy number uh, changes uh, in the system. So the idea is that the feedback and feed forward will always lower the output, but there are ways in which you can tune parameters in the circuit to bring that back up, so to compensate for it. Okay, the next one, uh, really fascinating. I'm curious about how these engineered circuits can be designed to couple with one another in a cell population. Is there a clear path toward rationally designing control systems that robustly enforce spatial structure set points? Uh, that's a fascinating question. I think there are several efforts from several groups, uh, especially in the mammalian realm, uh, where when you think, for example, of engineered organoids, right? So you really need uh, specific ratios of cell types in your uh, tissue in order to make sure that you hit right the desired uh, composition. And thus goes back to problems of uh, population control and cell cell communication. Um, and I think one research area that needs a lot of work there, I think it's coming up with more orthogonal uh, cell cell signaling um, uh, molecules, uh, but that's definitely uh, a very active research area. Okay, and I think this will have to be the, the last one before we move to the next one. Um, Really impressive work. I'm curious if you thought about linking your feedback or feed forward loops to cell survival to combat the impact of evolution. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, no, uh, we haven't thought about it. I mean, perhaps Ross has some idea, uh, but that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Okay, thanks to Domatia for a series of very interesting talks and thanks to the um, the community for asking all these great questions. Again, you can uh, continue the questions in the um, second part of today in, in GatherTown. So um, what I'd like to do right now is uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, she is Assistant Professor uh, Katie Galloway from MIT's Department of Chemical Engineering. Her research connects basic research questions in gene circuits, genome architecture, and cell fate transition tools uh, tool developments for biomedical applications. Again, she'll provide an uh, update on our current work and then a summary of the December 5th breakout response to the pandemic and opportunities for synthetic biology to prepare and recover from uh, pandemics. Okay, Katie, I'm going to pass it over to you. Hi, uh, it's nice to be with you all. I just want to verify you can hear me and you can see me um, from anyone who can respond here. Um, yes. Let's Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see here. Now, now, if the slides start, we're in we're in great shape. Um, one second. Let's see here. What do y'all see? You guys see hopefully some slides. Are we on the right display here? Yes. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak at the um, at this uh, consortium meeting. I'm really uh, delighted to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Um, and then uh, also starting to think about, we, we did a breakout session on uh, thinking about how synthetic biology can contribute uh, to preparing, um, responding, and then uh, recovering from a pandemic. And I'll tell you about that at the last bit. Um, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what my lab does. Basically, we uh, are a mammalian synthetic biology lab. And so we think a lot about cellular engineering. And um, Domitilla gave a wonderful introduction to um, so, so many of the topics <laughs> that are really uh, important within mammalian uh, synthetic biology. Um, so, and, and also in reprogramming, I'll be telling you a little bit about that today. Um, before I get going, I, I think I have to give you a disclaimer uh, that uh, the NIH, uh, these are my views. <laughs> and uh, that, those are my disclaimers and disclosures. Um, so uh, in, in our lab, we oftentimes uh, just think about um, uh, using synthetic biology to um, build uh, and expand from native functions and then to uh, build things that are entirely new. Um, and the context of native functions, we're trying to actually uh, reprogram cells from one cell type to another. Um, and cells don't normally do that, but they do make certain cell types like motor neurons. Um, and sort of for thinking about augmented functions, we're thinking about um, states that don't normally exist within the body. Um, and this provides us a really nice uh, framework for thinking about how do you engineer cells in general and how do you engineer them through the really complex and challenging process of reprogramming uh, from one state to another. Um, in theory, if we can do this process, we think we have a lot of hope in terms of figuring out the actual tools, um, methods, and mechanisms that are going to support um, these other augmented functions, such as uh, surveillance, uh, regeneration, and even potentially pacing. 
Um, so uh, this uh, is sort of the, the, the worldview, I guess, in, in terms of how synthetic biology can impact regenerative medicine, um, the excitement with um, iPSCs um, and reprogramming technologies in general uh, has started with from this idea that you can uh, have access to a huge array of uh, genetic backgrounds through patients um, and through their cells. And the process of reprogramming now gives you the opportunity to isolate and identify um, the cell types that are affected in neurodegenerative diseases, which otherwise would be um, completely inaccessible. Um, and so reprogramming gives you access to these cell types that in theory will allow you to do disease modeling uh, in a dish and, and more complex uh, cultures such as organoids, um, and that those uh, cells then can serve um, as then uh, sensors uh, themselves in phenotypic assays to be able to do therapeutic screening and identify pharmaceuticals. Um, where we've spent a lot of time and what's oftentimes hiding in these graphics is this reprogramming process is still quite challenging. In fact, cellular engineering in general remains quite challenging. Um, so we can do this, we can do it with some low efficiency. Um, and uh, the real challenge has been, how do we make this into a engineering workflow where we have really robust outcomes uh, in terms of the efficiency, the identity of our cells? And that's really important because um, generating enough cells is uh, a, a huge limitation. Also, if we want to uh, create uh, cell-based therapies, which is really the long-term goal, um, I think, for, for really closing the loop on regenerative medicine. Um, so to be able to um, uh, really also uh, use these cellular therapies, uh, but also doing disease modeling and drug screening rapidly, um, we also think synthetic biology can contribute to the screening process. Um, and especially uh, phenotypic assays, thinking about how do you actually control for a signal? Oftentimes, there's a lot of noise in these processes, cells uh, live and die or have different uh, phenotypes, and how do you control for that? How do you identify the right cells in your population? Uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity for synthetic circuits, uh, some of which uh, Domitilla suggested also in her work as, as, as ways of being able to identify cells and direct them. And especially exciting, um, you know, recently we've seen a lot of work as people are starting to do phenotypic assays in larger scale, um, and also thinking about different um, context, um, not just 2D assays, but also moving towards organoids, organ chips. And the nice thing about synthetic circuits are, in theory, you have one metric that can scale across all of these. Of course, the challenge is um, it's still very difficult to build a circuit de novo and have it function the way you want. Um, and then to generate these different cell types is, is not trivial either. And we're trying to solve both of those challenges um, in the lab uh, in different ways. Um, but this, uh, this vision started also with just a very simple uh, the simple vision of actually making those cells for uh, drug screening and disease modeling um, and in and, and, and the reprogramming process. This is a very interesting process. Uh, Domitillin alluded to this, that, you know, there's, there's seemingly um, some uh, transcription factor cocktail um, or levels or expression that may be optimal. Um, what I think is very interesting is that even sometimes, well, there's two challenges. One, can you actually precisely engineer those levels? Um, and how do the cells respond? Um, and so in our lab, we oftentimes are, are building uh, sort of this transition through reprogramming to then study what are the influences uh, on the cell level. This is really a molecular systems biology of, of the cells um, to try and understand why cell, one cell will reprogram and, and not another. And then on, on the sort of forward design side of that, well, how do we engineer our tools to actually do that? And again, this is sort of the, um, the goal is by understanding these transitions, we can actually build controllers that can guide cells through that. Um, and ultimately, that would allow us to, again, uh, move from uh, just reprogramming a few cells in a dish to actually doing really large scale disease in a dish modeling um, and even creating cellular therapies. Um, but what we noticed, and uh, this is work that started a, a, a while ago when I was a postdoc in a stem cell lab, is that we had this vision for like really cool cells, <laughs> organized, very complex systems that were going to function really well. Um, and we had this wonderful software, you know, that could reprogram cells, but very rarely. And most of the time what we ended up with was something that was kind of like a eight bit graphic. Um, and I put this forward because I think it's a good model for understanding what we, we found was ultimately the limitation is we are trying to run these very sophisticated uh, genetic programs within cells that just did not have the processing capacity um, to mediate the switch from one cell fate to another. And so we have this vision, um, but the cells can't run it. And that's because the primary cells are limited. And so with this model, we, we turn to thinking through, well, processing is the limit. Let's figure out a way of increasing the processing capacity um, of the cells. 
And what that looked like was basically developing this chemogenetic cocktail that allowed us to increase reprogramming rate about a hundredfold. And sort of that's the cartoon version of it. And this is the, <laughs> the cell base. Uh, but what it came down to is um, we identified a population of hypertranscribing, hyperproliferating cells. These are primary mouse embryonic fibroblasts. Most cells can't do this. Um, but this rare population, if you can generate it, will reprogram near deterministically into uh, a lot of different or into, into motor neurons that have a very mature profile. And so uh, these cells are limited for the reason that um, having this high processing functions um, puts an enormous amount of stress on the cell. Um, if you have high rates of DNA replication that's required for proliferation, right, you have to copy your DNA. Um, and high rates of transcription, this puts enormous strain on the genome. And we saw signs of genomic stress that would manifest as um, DNA uh, chromatin bridges, uh, micronuclei, um, and then just cell death. Um, and so these high rates of transcription and proliferation are uh, really problematic. There's very few cells that can actually mitigate this stress. Um, those cells are loaded up with enzymes called topoisomerases. Um, these topoisomerases um, then remove conflicts between transcription and replication. Uh, they resolve uh, tangling within the DNA, um, effectively mitigating the stress. And so this was allowed us by uh, creating these cells and creating cells that had high concentrations and activities of topoisomerases, we could mediate really robust reprogramming. And we could do this for the conversion of fibroblasts into motor neurons. Um, and we could do it across other cell types as well. Um, so it's not cocktail specific. We could take mouse embryonic fibroblasts and convert them into induced neurons. We could change the cocktail and make dopaminergic neurons, which are important for Parkinson's. Um, and we could make uh, induced hair cells, which are the cells of the inner ear that um, are often poisoned by uh, cisplatin during uh, chemotherapy. Um, additionally, we were able to take adult cells and reprogram those um, using the, the cocktails that we developed. In the end, we what we came to though understand is that this process is really challenging within primary cells. Um, and that the, pro the number of transcription factors um, and the process just is normally restricted in primary cells. And I hope that's one thing you take away from the talk um, is that engineering things, <laughs> engineering circuits to work in primary cells is very challenging. Um, and uh, we're still working through how do we actually mitigate the, the stress that we induce with our programs so that they can actually function. Um, and so that was actually the, the first project uh, that um, one of the first graduate students in the lab, Nathan Wong, uh, took on was thinking through, well, how do we not, not just, um, how do we actually design these systems so that they run really well on primary cells? So if, uh, you know, these six different transcription factors that we introduce for reprogramming and uh, are implementing a lot of stress and also creating a lot of uh, potential noise in terms of we don't control the stoichiometry, um, maybe we could reduce that number. Um, and get nice reprogramming. Um, but this is a challenge. Like if you drop out a transcription factor, can you really get the cells to reprogram? And or how much of a hit are you gonna take in terms of uh, reducing these? So um, what Nathan did was he actually dropped this cocktail down to two to three different transcription factors that were sufficient to make motor neurons from uh, ESCs, which is a very unique and privileged uh, epigenetic state and asked the question, well, are these gonna really be enough to reprogram our MEFs? into induced motor neurons. And additionally, he collapsed these two oncogenes that we use to make that really highly plastic population of cells into another one. So we can now deliver this on a, on a minimal and more compact uh, system. And we were hoping, okay, maybe this won't be terrible in terms of reprogramming because we, we, you know, we've made this much more efficient in terms of just our production. Um, how will it work in actually making the induced motor neurons that we care about? And you can see the green lighting up here as the cells reprogram across these um, uh, these days. And it normally takes us about two weeks to finish the reprogramming process. Um, so what Nathan saw was that actually minimizing this transcription factor cocktail actually improved um, the number of cells that we could generate and even seemed to um, uh, speed up how fast we were seeing this HB9 GFP motor neuron reporter light up. Um, so this is very exciting to us because it meant that we suddenly had a tool where we only had one genetic cocktail of transcription factors that could be um, you know, sufficient for reprogramming. So we could had potentially then something that with a TET inducible system, you could really simply control, right? Now we can start ask questions about like levels and timing and ask, when do we need to actually intervene in these cells? What are all the processes that are happening? Um, but uh, we notice there's a challenge with our tools still, uh, right? So just add a TET inducible controller here, turn that thing on and ask like, how do things happen? Not entirely trivial. And um, what Casey uh, went at Love did in the lab is she just wanted to go in and ask, okay, well, 
Um, you know, in, in terms of not just controlling the transcription factors, could we control just anything um, in mouse embryonic fibroblasts? And like, what's the challenge there? And so uh, Casey built a system where she has um, a simple TET inducible all-in-one, so we can deliver this all in one time uh, on lentiviruses. Again, these are primary cells. They're not easy to transfect. In fact, they're not at all easy to transfect. Um, and then she wanted to ask, okay, what happens to uh, my ability to turn on this, this uh, red fluorescent protein? If I can turn this on, then I can control this nil transcription factor cassette. Uh, but if I can't, then there, maybe there's a limitation there. Um, and so when she made her virus, um, you could see there's a nice, pretty good, ro robust response of Ruby um, and uh, Green Lantern, so we can see the RTTA, um, but it's a bit of mosaicism, right? This is kind of what we expect oftentimes, uh, you know, maybe it was the virus, maybe it was the cells. Um, but what was really surprising was when she went in and looked at what the mouse embryonic fibroblasts look like. And what she saw was there was absolutely no response. We couldn't turn on RFP, you know, the same Ruby at all. The cells were not red. Um, and Again, oftentimes we will, in synthetic biology, just gate these cells and say, I'll just look at these. Here, there are no cells to gate. We can't ask how this process proceeds because there's just absolutely no response. And so the question is, why does that happen? Um, and this is a bit of motivation um, here. And then from previous results that were similar to this, like, you know, how, why is this not working? Um, our, again, this is sort of our present challenge. And it's summarized in this meme <laughs> that oftentimes uh, we're finding uh, that the things that work in our 293Ts are just not translating to primary cells. Um, that was a big motivation for us in terms of thinking, if we want to be a synthetic biology lab that's actually engineering primary cells, how do we solve this and what is the issue? Um, so that was sort of the motivation or part of the motivation for the next part of this talk, which I'll tell you how we were are starting to change the way we're doing designs um, based on some modeling work and then some experiments. Um, so at the basic level, right, even a tet inducible system, essentially we are looking at turning on gene expression through a binding event that induces uh, transcription and then translation of our protein. This is, of course, oftentimes a little messy. Maybe that's why you get your mosaicism, uh, right? You'd expect some sort of um, uh, noise, essentially, in the system. And of course, how do we control this? This is a great, I think, problem. Uh, and of course, transcriptional noise only makes this uh, worse. Um, and I think it's even more, it's, it's even worse than that in the sense that when we build synthetic circuits, sir, we're turning on one protein here, but if we actually want those to then be inputs to new systems, that noise is going to compound. Um, and that's a really big problem if you want to have precision in your gene circuits. Um, so are we without, you know, how, how, how does this, how can we control this? We can barely turn on a red fluorescent protein. Um, and even when we do, it's noisy. And, and really, I think the answer for us is, you know, how do native systems do this? As synthetic biologists, we're oftentimes thinking about, you know, how do bio native systems actually work? Um, and this was an inspiration for us in terms of thinking about um, when we look at things like development, you actually see very synchronous, precise regulation of transcriptional events. Um, and what we've noticed is that sometimes that is corresponds to a very particular genome organization. Um, and I'll define a little bit more about what I mean uh, with respect to that. So the genome is organized across many length and time scales um, uh, shown here. Uh, so everything from DNA binding to then different compartments uh, in the, the nucleus. Uh, this is a very large uh, number of different uh, scales and orders of magnitude. As synthetic biologists, we're oftentimes thinking about engineering DNA binding events um, at the level of where uh, you have uh, transcription, RNA polymerase is coming in binding and then inducing different uh, activity of different genes. What we started thinking about was how could the transcriptional activity start to influence um, the actual structure through mechanical processes. Um, and at this next level up from binding that there's actually mechanical domains, which we call uh, supercoils that emerge through the process of transcription. Um, and so this got us thinking, how could we how might this process actually influence our designs? And are we designing in the most optimal way? Um, or can we learn something from the organization of native genomes? Um, and so uh, Christopher Johnstone, a uh, student in the graduate student in the lab, started asking the question um, how could physical co localization change our model of gene regulation? Co localization is something we do all the time in synthetic systems because we want to deliver one thing. Um, and that means that we are either very vulnerable um, or missing, maybe even missing an opportunity if we're not thinking about those designs. Um, so we started thinking about co-localization um, from the pro and how it's affecting uh, transcription. 
And so um, transcription itself is uh, going to change the physical state of DNA through it, the binding and transcriptional elongation process. As RNA polymerase binds, uh, the uh, polymerase will track along the, the DNA twisting uh, and, and winding around. Uh, and due to uh, the growing tail of mRNA, this induces a torque on the DNA, resulting in overwound DNA head that's positively supercoiled and underwound DNA behind. Um, so this creates essentially then a directionality, a symmetry breaking on uh, this DNA template. That means that depending on where your genes are, are along a, a template, um, you can have a facilitated binding as uh, at behind an RNA polymerase where there's under where binding of RNA polymerase is favorable to that loosely packed, negatively supercoiled DNA, whereas polymerase binding uh, is uh, unfavored at these overwound, positively supercoiled states. What that means then is transcription itself is biasing the ability of subsequent polymerase binding and transcription events. We call this supercoiling mediated feedback um, in that uh, you now have this biasing. Uh, and so to ask the question of how this actually, the orientation and the order of your genes actually impacts transcription, how you can design for this, uh, Chris started uh, do, developing some uh, models and simulation uh, to ask, if we orient our genes in a convergent, divergent, or two different tandem orientations, how does that actually affect um, the expression? In other words, what does your neighbor do? Does that actually affect what you do in terms of transcription? Um, so to give you an idea of what this looks like, I think it's easier to see. Um, so here we have an inducible gene and a reporter. This uh, gene is simulated as a constitutive gene, uh, so constitutively expressed, where RNA polymerase will bind stochastically. Um, and then this inducible gene we can turn on at some time and ask the question, how does reporter expression change when we induce a neighboring gene? Um, and it can be in any one of these uh, syntaxes. And by syntax, I mean, it's the relative order and orientation of those genes. Um, and then we can watch and see how that influences supercoiling and how that supercoiling is then going to affect the expression of the RNAs. Um, and so what you can see at first is there are RNA polymerases binding and RNAs being expressed, which you can see here. Um, and then we're gonna turn on this, this second gene, but what you can see right now is positive supercoilings accumulating downstream and negatively supercoiled uh, DNA is accumulating upstream of this promoter. And what's gonna happen when we turn on this gene is you're gonna start to see positive supercoiling pushing into either promoter creating uh, this either or response where suddenly RNA polymerase binding and transcription becomes anti-correlated um, or either or between these two genes just based on uh, the supercoiled state of the DNA. Um, conversely, if you have your genes oriented in a divergent syntax, um, what you can see is that at first you have, again, a single gene binding and then negative supercoiling is accumulating between these two promoters. And so as soon as you induce the second gene, what you start to see is actually really robust transcriptional coordination. And the probability that one is uh, on when the other gene is, is on uh, substantially increases and you get uh, amplification and co-bursting. Um, so again, uh, summarized here in these uh, single traces of these simulations, you can see this either or behavior in the convergent, the divergent has correlated bursting. And then tandem, which happens to be, I think, the most common uh, design used within synthetic biology experimentally, um, shows a really interesting phenomena, which we call upstream dominance, um, where uh, this upstream gene, when it's on, will keep the downstream gene from turning on. And if this upstream gene is induced, it can actually drive the downstream gene to silencing through the um, uh, accumulation of positive supercoiling in the promoter region where uh, you would start transcription. The other thing that was quite interesting about this is we noticed that there were very different, that, that we could get differences in noise profile. So not just the levels and the coordination, um, but the, the variance in our reporter changes depending upon the activity of that neighboring gene. And so what you can see here in any of these orientations, the noise or the standard deviation here um, is very similar. As soon as we induce uh, that adjacent gene, you can see that for the convergent, uh, the variation goes up substantially. Um, whereas for the divergent and the upstream tandem, it, it actually drops. 
Um, so not only can we control potentially the coordination between two genes, we can actually control their variants as well, depending on how we construct um, uh, these systems. And of course, if we look at these um, over time at a steady state across the distribution of runs, um, we can see across these different syntaxes um, that depending upon uh, your uh, syntax, you get different distributions of the inducible gene and the reporter with the um, divergent showing high expression of both, the convergent showing a widespread across, um, uh, just as you might expect from that uh, anti-correlated uh, bursting, and then the tandem showing basically this upstream dominance. Uh, and, and so then, okay, these things are coupled through their physical co-localization, but what does it mean to be physically co-localized? Like how far do they have, can, you know, can they be apart? Um, what we observe, and you can see here, as we change the intergene spacing and look at the reporter output, um, for the same levels, this is different levels of induction here, these colored traces, you can see that in general, especially between convergent, divergent, and the, and the and upstream tandem, there's no amount of spacing that really substantially changes this reporter output, especially for the convergent, it's almost completely flat. In other words, if your reporter, um, if these two promoters are at the same level, there's just no distance that you can sp uh, spread these, that you're not going to have some sort of coupled effect. Um, it's a little bit different with the downstream tandem as you start to get towards 10 KB and you have uh, you know, some weaker levels of induction, uh, then you can actually get less coupling. Uh, but that's a pretty big difference uh, in, in length scale and oftentimes much bigger than we're engineering. Um, so just a summary of what we found from the modeling um, is basically the supercoiling mediated feedback uh, can uh, couple genes uh, that are co-localized as far as 10 KB apart. Um, that that uh, coupling, and it shows a very syntax-specific expression profiles where genes are coupled um, and their expression levels vary depending upon their uh, relative uh, position. Uh, we also sh don't show, I haven't showed you today, but they show differences in, in, in bursting uh, dynamics. Um, and this actually affects the stability of toggle switches um, and can dynamically uh, couple uh, transcription uh, across uh, biochemically linked uh, sets of genes too. I won't tell you that for the sake of time. Um, so these are things we think are pretty important for design and can potentially influence whether we can turn on even a basic gene. Um, and, and we're not the first people to think about supercoiling. There's actually lots of nice models out there, especially within the last year. There's been a nice one from Herbert Levine's group and from Sahan Hormoz, which I'd encourage you to, to check out. Um, beyond modeling, um, uh, supercoiling is an effect that is known to affect bursting uh, within bacterial systems, um, and we think is uh, probably affects mammalian systems as well. Um, and there's been some nice work to integrate the this idea of the compositional context, so the relative orientation um, in uh, plasmid systems in bacteria, uh, from Jim Collins and Richard Murray's group, uh, led by Enoch Young. Um, so. This is a lot of, uh, of what we, we think could happen in mammalian systems, we want it to know. So I've showed you a model in which we think that uh, a very simple uh, 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 system of, of, of two promoters with just fluorescent proteins should suddenly become coupled in a way that um, as you turn on this gene, you'd see differences uh, in uh, the, the, the adjacent gene. And depending upon the relative construction of these, so divergent versus tandem, you should get different results. Um, so again, with the divergent, you'd expect that as you turn on this ruby, you'd start to see an increase in your green lantern. Um, however, if you build this in tandem, your, uh, your tet inducible element should actually drive this green lantern uh, to silence as you increase it. Um, and so Chris went in and actually uh, integrated these constructs into 293Ts <laughs> with the piggyback. Um, and what he observed was exactly what we expected. Um, we saw that the divergent amplified as we increased the expression, and we saw that the uh, tandem silenced. Um, and what I'm not showing you here is that there's an RTTA integrated elsewhere. Um, and uh, so, so this is nice. Uh, we were very excited about this, um, but I was especially encouraged when uh, we we uh, heard from uh, from Ross Jones, <laughs> who I think you've heard about already in this this meeting. Um, hey, Ross, how's it going? Um, uh, so. Ross was also interested in these positional effects, um, and he was looking at um, taking constitutive promoters um, and uh, expressing genes uh, in tandem uh, in iPSCs, and these are integrated with piggyback. And so what Ross did is he noticed that this upstream gene, 
um, was really well expressed and his downstream gene uh, uh, was, was weakly expressed. And he did this nice ex control experiment where he reversed the position to ask, is it the position that matters or is it the promoter and the sequence? Um, and what he saw, and which was really exciting because it's in alignment with what we pr would predict is that as soon as he switched the position of this um, neon green gene, uh, the expression shifted towards um, uh, towards that gene, whereas you saw a lower expression of this uh, tag BFP. Um, and we think again that this this seems to suggest that this upstream dominance is a real effect. Um, in, in our mode of thinking, it, it's certainly influencing how we're thinking about mechanisms of transgene silencing. Um, there's a nice review we, we, we got to contribute to with a number of people within the mammalian synthetic biology uh, community, which was led by uh, Tara Deans and um, also um, uh, Josh Lunder's lab contributed to this as well. Um, and, and we're starting to ask the question, oftentimes, you know, we will integrate transgenes. Um, and over time, we noticed that those genes silence. Um, and we think there's a lot of different mechanisms that could support that silencing, um, but we think the relative position is, is one of those things. Um, so with this idea, um, Casey went back and said, all right, if the tandem happens to be a particularly fragile design for my all-in-one, where this upstream promoter, this tetanusable promoter is then driving to silence this RTTA, potentially that could be why I didn't get robust expression um, in my 293Ts or in my maps. Um, and so if I take, right, and re recall we had this mosaicism and there's absolutely no result, you know, no response in our primary cells. Um, she said, well, if we, we build this in divergent, then uh, potentially this could actually support robust, app, you know, expression of the RTTA, the Green Lantern and the Ruby, and we get everything working. Um, and it was very encouraging when indeed this seemed to solve the problem entirely, um, where you have this really uniform response in 293Ts, um, and you see this restored response within the map. So suddenly we actually are able to express Ruby, whereas before we were not. Um, and so this was a nice um, validation to us that this worked, uh, but it was especially in, uh, great when we looked in the, in the, in the, in the <laughs> end of the microscope. Uh, this hopefully gives you an idea of like what we're looking at when we see no response versus a really nice ro robust response. Um, this we can work with and start doing some engineering with. Um, so it's kind of a summary. Um, we think that supercoiling mediated feedback is, is really important. It seems to affect diverse promoter systems. Um, we could see about a five-fold difference just in um, our, our green lantern expression when we induced a TET-inducible system, whether in divergent or tandem. Um, that's a pretty big difference, and oftentimes at the scale of a lot of different regulatory elements that would interact, um, so it could have a pretty big effect. Um, uh, Ross did a nice job showing that this tandem syntax seems to show this upstream dominance, um, depend, when you have these uh, integrated IPSCs, um, our divergent uh, syntax allowed us to restore the function of this TET all-in-one system in primary cells. Um, and so uh, just to summarize, the supercoiling mediated feedback seems to couple and tune transcription. Um, and the thing that I think about that is really interesting about this is um, it suggests that the process of transcription, not just the products, are really important for um, creating really precise transcriptional control. The other thing I'll highlight, this process of, of, of feedback, if you couldn't see it from the simulations, it's, it's really fast. It's much faster than the protein mediated feedback because you don't have to go through a translational step. Um, and so we think this is actually a very nice way of being able to then minimize noise and control um, a lot of different uh, behaviors on, on a scale that's before just been uh, completely inaccessible. Um, one thing that we don't know yet, um, our model is consistent um, with our data and that we think that this is mediated by supercoiling. There are actually direct assays we need to do to measure that. Um, it also creates questions about how are, does this, these supercoiling effects actually interact with things we know are important for gene regulation, such as nucleosome structure and histone marks. Uh, we don't know the answer to that, but we'd like to. Um, and finally, um, it, it really is motivating us to think about how do we design circuits to monitor and guide cell fate transitions. Um, we think that now we have a tool with our, our, our tet all in one where we can go in and start to control expression uh, really well within a reprogramming context. Again, taking these primary cells and turning on expression and be able to precisely titrate um, different uh, proteins to ask questions. Um, and, and, and hopefully I'll have more results for you guys to tell you about what, what we find out. Um, Additionally, you know, circuits are not just tools that we use to drive this process. We think that circuits will be used to actually screen and identify different processes that are going on inside of cells to identify therapeutics. 
Um, and that means that our sensors need to actually be pretty precise in how they report. Um, I was especially entertained when we started thinking about, um, when we really started thinking about uh, how do we engineer circuits to do this, uh, this disease modeling and drug discovery process, the first thing we um, thought about doing is like, well, we'll just add in a control reporter, right? That's the thing you would do is you, you're like, well, let's take something and control generally for activity. We'll just have some constitutive promoter. Um, we'll put it downstream of our pathway promoter. That way we know it's there. It's physically tied. Um, and then we can use that to normalize for our responses. And what we've seen through this is that potentially that this is a very confounded design and could frustrate efforts if you wanted to do drug screening, because as this pathway reporter turns on, you could imagine that it's going to silence your control reporter and it's really going to artificially inflate um, then uh, your metrics. And so even thinking about how we build circuits to give us quantitative metrics in screening, uh, we think we have to take into uh, consideration the, these uh, effects of, of DNA supercoiling, um, even when we're thinking about just very simple expression, things that aren't otherwise physically linked, um, because, or aren't obviously linked biochemically, become linked through their physical co-localization. Um, all right, so this is something we think is important. Um, I want to say um, thank you to my lab and uh, who, who's been uh, wonderful um, uh, over these last, guys. We, we were here, we've been here about uh, three years at MIT, um, uh, especially thanks to, uh, for Nathan to, for looking at that minimal cocktail, it's really motivated us to think through, um, you know, the, how to engineer these cells. Um, for Chris for doing the modeling, Casey for looking at this Ted All-in-One, Ross for uh, sharing your really cool data and doing some exciting uh, work in uh, IPSC space with respect to this positional context effects. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I, or should I pause to take questions here or I, I turn directly to the breakout? I can't remember what the what the protocol is here. Jermont, can you remind me? Uh, I think you can just go into the breakout and we'll take questions. Okay, great. Oh. Um, so, so those are the things that we, we've learned about uh, engineering cells. Um, the uh, we, we had this nice breakout session, uh, gosh, is it a week and a half ago, I think now, on um, something that's, uh, the, the question was, um, how do we use synthetic biology, not just specifically to engineer cells, but to think about broader, um, you know, how do we basically use synthetic biology to prepare and recover from a pandemic? And so during that time, um, we focused on sort of four, four, four things that we thought that synthetic biology could do. Um, and they're really the phases of the uh, pandemic. So we have uh, thought a lot about preparing for a pandemic. Um, how do you actually then respond when you're in the middle of a pandemic? And I think this is probably, you know, something everyone's been <laughs> experiencing, like how do we prepare and, 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 and man manage? Um, and then towards the end, we started to think about, well, how do we actually recover from a pandemic? Um, how do we um, uh, deal with all of the, uh, collateral damage that we couldn't prevent. Um, of course, we'd like to prevent a lot of things, but for the things we can't, how do we use synthetic biology to uh, recover? And so I'm just going to hit some highlights, and then at the end, I'm going to cover what we came up with as a wish list of things that we think we can do to prepare um, to respond when a, a pandemic emerges, and then also to recover from this pandemic, but also to look forward to general recovery. Um, so at the at the breakout, uh, we covered the uh, NA. I, uh, N -I -A -I -D, uh, pandemic preparedness plan. Um, and the thing that uh, stood out to me here is um, constantly we're thinking uh, with respect to pandemic pre preparedness, um, how do you actually you know, identify these pathogens of concern um, and shorten the timelines to that identification? Um, and then potentially then use and, and figure out what are, use existing tools, but also develop tools so that we can identify them. Um, and so uh, NIAID uh, thinks about this as uh, three different sort of phases where you have this pathogen selection. So you're constantly identifying here, then moving this into different phases of you know, ongoing research to try and understand um, these viruses and different viral groups, um, and then running things through clinical trials. Um, and obviously this creates a, a very specific uh, stereotypical uh, response and workflow that it then has a characteristic time. And really one of the issues is how do we speed up that response time um, at any one of these phases and this loop? Um, so there's, we, we in turn, thinking about the response, we're probably all very uh, familiar with this idea that there's various ways in which we can think about responding, um, creating especially point of care diagnoses came up as something important. 
Um, developing RNAs and diversifying that through synthetic biology was an in of interest. Um, additionally, how do we actually improve drug screening uh, so that we can mitigate the issues of any given virus? How do we do that in a, a rapid way, um, faster than uh, our current modeling systems? And then finally, uh, especially with respect to COVID, the damage associated with the virus, especially within cardiac and neural tissue, came up as something that we're going to be dealing with not only acutely, um, but also something potentially for a very long time. And so how can synthetic biology potentially um, provide uh, cell-based therapies potentially to, um, or drugs, uh, to try and uh, engineer a, a re repair within these damaged systems? Um, so what we came up with from, from our discussion uh, across all of these topics was kind of a wish list of things that we think that we can do to prepare, respond, uh, and recover. And so uh, especially the rapid identification of emerging threats, there's opportunities to think through how do we do that? Um, and whether that's going to be um, molecular diagnostics or actually living diagnostics, are there cells? What are the, what are the best ways? And there's opportunities to innovate there. Um, understanding evolutionary pressures, like how do we think about driving viruses in, in ways in which um, we can deal with them better? Are there ways that we can understand uh, the course of pandemics and we can actually uh, intervene uh, more effectively, uh, potentially driving viruses or bacteria to be less, less pathogenic? Um, additionally, one thing that, that came up is, you know, it, there's uh, oftentimes not a standard chassis for the development uh, of some of our, our our vaccines, and this is potentially an issue um, in terms of being able to rapidly uh, turn out different types of uh, vaccine products. Um, and can we standardize this so that um, not only is this effective scientifically, uh, but is also um, going to clear the FDA, which is a in this case, you know, we had rapid acceleration across the pandemic of um, of regulatory clearance. Um, but thinking through ongoing pandemics uh, or uh, <laughs> future pandemics, um, how do we make this process more seamless um, through what we develop in terms of um, chassis? Uh, additionally, in terms of preparation, um, improving cellular engineering was, a, was really a theme of our discussion. We spent a lot of time thinking about that um, and how do we actually do this process much faster and how do we start to think about that now? Um, Generally, cell engineering is extremely slow. That means for production of um, vaccines or other components for drug screening, it's gonna be a very slow process. Um, and so how do we make that faster? And especially automation was, was touched on. Um, in terms of response, we talked about worldwide infrastructure that we can't just think be US centric in terms of thinking about a pandemic, that anything that we solve here needs to be solved worldwide because pandemics are not limited by countries, especially in this our global society. Um, and so we need to think about developing infrastructure that's portable across to a variety of contexts um, and are developed before the next pandemic hits. Um, additionally, in terms of thinking about drugs that can uh, be um, used to uh, mitigate the, the effects of an ongoing pandemic, model cell lines that can more effectively screen for those drugs was something that we, uh, we touched on. Uh, can we improve the phenotypic screening um, also with circuits or, or other tools, automation, um, again, to be able to identify therapies more rapidly? Um, and then finally, uh, how do we recover from the, uh, a pandemic and use cells as um, agents to screen for either continuing effects um, that can then be responded to or even identified, um, and then potentially uh, and, and again, sort of ambitious ideas that can we actually use synthetic biology tools for targeted tissue regeneration? And is that going to be molecules or is it going to be cells or some combination? Um, so that was basically the what we covered in terms of these topics. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, kind of end, end there, take questions and um, uh, it, wherever, uh, wherever that might go. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Okay, so what what I'll do is just read a couple of questions from the chat, and then we'll we'll end uh, at twelve thirty, just like on schedule. Uh, um, so, what is the relative time scale of supercoiling spreading versus uh, TF binding kinetics? Like, if two nearby tandem genes start transcribing at the same time, about how long would it would you expect it to take for the upstream one to suppress the downstream downstream one per distance away? So, supercoiling diffuses remarkably fast. It should be on the scale of um, 
I, I believe it should be on the scale of seconds or sub-seconds. It's extremely, extremely fast. Um, so it's going to be slower probably than transcription factor binding, maybe, but it depends on the kinetics of any given transcription factor. Some, right, so transcription factor binding oftentimes is going to have uh, things that are have fast, uh, maybe have fast on kinetics, slow off. So actually, um, you could be on the order of transcription factor binding depending upon the transcription factor. Um, yeah. Okay, um, next one. Great talk. What is the mechanism for the difference between the divergent and tandem designs? How did the simulation set up? What's the different? Sorry, can you repeat that, Jermont? Sure. What is the mechanism for the difference between the divergent and tandem designs? Right. So the, 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 the mechanism that we are, are looking at in, in the modeling is simply that you have, um, we're, we're setting up the simulation such that there is an energy landscape of binding that is then set by the supercoiling density. And so as transcription um, uh, occurs at one site, at one of those two genes, you're then um, changing that energy landscape across the adjacent gene, either by creating negative supercoiling behind, which could affect then a divergent gene and positively bias, or you're pushing positive supercoiling downstream. And if you have a downstream tandem gene, you're in, inducing basically positive supercoiling across that promoter region. And then you're, um, the energy of binding for that mRNA polymerase is then um, much higher. And so you're basically inhibiting the RNA polymerase loading. Okay, and I think this will be the last one. The observation of control of transcription as a result of structural change in DNA due to transcription is a fascinating idea. Is this kind of control seen in any natural non-engineered conditions? So that's a great question. One of the things that actually motivated us was seeing this amazing transcriptional uh, coordination between two divergent genes within the zebrafish um, somite formation network. I didn't have time to get to this, but if you look in maybe figure six of our paper, <laughs> there's actually this really beautiful transcriptional coordination that had been seen previously um, in zebrafish for uh, 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 somite formation. And basically, if you mutate opposite allele so that you have intact copies only on the opposite, so it's it's basically they are um, in trans but not in cis, um, the trans expression of those proteins does not support transcriptional coordination, um, and you don't get nice somite formation. Um, whereas if, as long as they're on the same allele, you can knock out one copy, and you'll still get the formation. And no one, no, I mean, and so no one really knows the, the mechanism by which that transcriptional coordination is um, generated, but we would propose that, pos that, that supercoiling, that negative supercoiling in these divergently expressed genes is actually potentially one mechanism by which you can get this transcriptional coordination um, that is necessary for zebrafish somite formation. Okay, thank you very much for the, for the great talk. And I think what we'll do is we'll go on break until uh, 1245. Thank you, right, Jerome. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone back. And what we'll do is uh, go to our uh, third speaker. So I'd like to introduce Associate Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, uh, Josh Leonard. He's from uh, Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering. So his uh, research is at the interface of systems and synthetic biology in order to probe and program the function of complex multicellular systems to develop transformative biotechnologies and enable a new paradigm of design-driven medicine. So again, he'll provide an update on the current work. And what I'll do is provide a summary of our breakout session, um, control theory, toolkits, and modeling. So with that, I will pass it to Josh. Great, thanks, Jermont. And it's good to be here with everyone. Um, it's also a pleasure to follow on the brilliant introductions by Damatilla and Katie in the earlier two talks. And so I pitched my topic today to lean into this particular angle that was mentioned by both of our prior speakers, um, focusing on the challenges and really some of the opportunities we're looking at doing forward design in engineered mammalian systems. And I'll try to resonate with some of the stories we heard about earlier today um, and identify some opportunities uh, for discussion. So I do have the chat handy uh, if you want to interrupt that way. Otherwise, we can do the talking at the end. A uh, quick disclaimer uh, that I do have a financial conflict of interest and that some of the work I'll be telling you about has been licensed in a startup company. Um, so I want to make sure that is uh, clearly stated here 
And so I thought I'd start with uh, one of my favorite videos. And in addition to being a really cool video, the official citation, which I swear is what I've written on the slide here, sometime in the 1950s, uh, David Rogers' group filmed this uh, idea or this video of an amino cell chasing down a bacterium. And the key bits here are that we can really infer the causality and the intentionality of that process, but it remains very hard to think about how to break that down, much less encode that kind of complex process. So in a lot of the things we've been talking about with engineered cellular functions, what we're oftentimes trying to do is if we're using a cell in the first place, it is a complicated material to be working with. And the distinct advantage a cell brings is some of those things that are hardest to engineer. And so oftentimes when we're talking, um, at least in the current viewing of engineered cell therapies, we're talking about harnessing natural functions, but redirecting them to do what we want and when we want, um, but otherwise leverage some of that um, evolved uh, complexity that exists. So no matter which angle you're coming at from a synthetic biology perspective, I think a shared framework here is that we want to be able to go from an abstract design statement, which might be a clinical insight or a preclinical observation, having a way to manifest that in the design and having the design work as predicted. And I think at different points in the story of synthetic biology, we have imagined each of those pieces to be a more difficult or easy transition. And so I'll try to provide a little bit of the state of the art as to which parts of that process have become easier, which parts of that process remain challenging. And in particular, just as a reminder, the goal here is not necessarily to have this work the first time because that's how engineering works. It's not really how engineering works in many ways. The goal here is just to make it faster, to go from a good idea or a potentially good idea to the evaluation of the idea in order to make overall use of cell therapies more practical, and uh, exponentially more efficient. So uh, a big motivation that I think most in the audience, if not everyone is involved with this, the existence of engineered cell therapies for treating cancer as a really promising vanguard of this approach. Um, I've highlighted a cartoon here and a, a famous patient, Emily Whitehead, um, who benefited from uh, CAR T cell therapies in this example here. What I really wanted to highlight is that even from the beginning of the CAR T cell revolution, it was recognized by the innovators and others that despite the promise for treating some particular patients and with some particular types of cancers, there is a lot of hard engineering work to be done here. And that has inspired a lot of what we are doing in the field of familiar synthetic biology one way or the other here. Um, in particular, we were motivated by the idea that the conditions required to benefit from a cancer immunotherapy like CAR T cell therapy um, importantly includes foreknowledge of the tumor antigens or antigen that make that surface of the cancer cell distinct from healthy cells. And so that is something we know for some cancers, something we don't know for other cancers, and something that does not exist for still other cancers. So how can we use that same promise, maybe using synthetic biology, to link things we do know about the cancer to the activation of a therapeutic in a way that's distinct from the way that happens in the context of the, the pioneering CAR T cell approaches. The other that's a very pragmatic thing that I'll use as kind of foreshadowing for today more than anything is that it remains very expensive to do this. It's about a quarter million dollars per treatment for CAR T cell therapies, and it incurs incredible manufacturing challenges as well that make it just very hard to roll this out from all the patients who could benefit from it. Those are also opportunities where folks working in the space can make a real substantive dent. So the design challenge that I'll use as a motivation for some of the work I'll tell you about today is uh, inspired by that first bullet point, and that's the idea that there are many features that make the tumor microenvironment distinct from healthy environments that aren't necessarily cancer antigens. And our thought was if we could engineer a cell therapy to become selectively activated and cytotoxic in the tumor microenvironment, you could limit that toxicity to the tumor site and uh, even without specifically antigen recognition, achieve some of the benefits of this up. And this is motivated by some animal work showing that, for example, you can administer cytokines locally into a tumor that you can find, then you can convert a cold tumor into a hot tumor, and the existing immune response can do a lot of anti-tumor killing. So how do we make a cell therapy smart enough to become activated in the microenvironment? And there are a few ideas we'll talk about. The first um, thing we noticed when breaking up this problem a number of years ago, so this is about a, almost a decade ago now, that we started looking at some of these um, things, was that uh, looking at the space at that time, uh, if you wanted to break down that kind of a design goal, we need sensors, we need processors, and we need actuators. Um, really, this is not because we're trying to force a cell to work like a mechanical or electronic device. 
it's because our creativity for how to design something um, is oftentimes limited by what we've seen before. And in this case, this is how you break down a problem in other spaces of engineering. And so it becomes a facile way of breaking down this complex problem into something we can get our hands on. And so at that time, it was pretty clear that although there were some systems for doing control of gene expression and there were some sensors or receptors that had been pioneered, we really didn't have parts at the scale that were necessary to do the kind of designs and applications that we were shooting for. So um, in particular, we decided that um, despite the promise of using native receptors in new ways, there are some limitations with that approach. And what we decided to go after was a synthetic receptor, which in this case was a receptor platform that was invented by uh, Nicole Derringer, who's uh, on the call with us today. Um, and it, we called it the MESA sensor architecture, uh, modular extracellular sensor architecture. And the basic premise here is that this is a self-contained receptor and signal transduction system. Ligand binding induced dimerization leads to a transcleavage event that releases a transcription factor to turn on output gene expression. And what we showed in a series of stories was that first, the challenge was to figure out how to build a protein that exhibited the kinetics that this cartoon suggests should be possible. And once we had that, we found that that same kind of receptor could be deployed in different types of cells. We developed this in workhorse HEK cells. And when those functional receptors were moved over to things like T cells, they still function because their function is not dependent upon the existence or absence of signal transduction factors that may be specific to one cell type or the other. We also showed that although this is much harder to get it to work in the first place than a natural receptor would be, that you then, after you get to a functional receptor, get the benefits of modularity and the ability to leverage those findings to build new receptors here. And this is, in general, a big story of synthetic biology. You have the things that work well immediately derived from nature that are kind of hard to change too far away from their starting point, the things that are invented. Uh, this isn't de novo, this is sort of Frankenstein approach, which are harder to get to work initially, but then the benefits really accrue afterwards by having this ability to interpret and iterate on your designs. And so, for example, we put those together to show we could build a novel receptor that senses VEGF, a tumor microenvironment associated factor, and through a Cas9 based transcription factor, turns on the endogenous IL2 locus. And the reason that's important is that there is no cell in our body that senses VEGF and produces IL2 in response. So you can create entirely novel functionalities, and this goes back to these augmented functionalities that uh, Katie motivated in the prior talk here. And that just really is a way to see if that is attractive, and if you can manifest many different ideas like that, you can discover new functionalities in a way that's distinct from what we might do from an existing exploratory approach. So the fun part of the story is that now we have a bajillion receptors as a field, and so this is a review that um, recently I, uh, my team co-wrote with Leo Morsut's team um, from UC, and what we really summarized in this study was how has this space changed in the about decade between the first engineered receptors and where we are today. And there's two key bits. We now have many different mechanisms for sensing many different things and, mod and then uh, transducing that sensing event into different cellular states in different ways. And that's a wonderful advance and, and palette upon which to build some designs. A common challenge, though, is that oftentimes it is challenging to put these together or to put sensors with anything downstream from that. And, and oftentimes that's because we don't necessarily design these initial bits with those downstream compositional challenges in mind. And so there might be an aspect of the designs, there might be an aspect of the characterization, but this is an important transition in our space in that we don't have a lack of parts, really. We have a challenge of how to take the things we have and figure out how to put them together in useful ways. So one of the things that we highlight kind of in our story is one that I think resonates with several different presentations today, and that is that in general, we want our designs to perform robustly. And so I'll sort of map that into what we now think across these different um, challenge or application spaces uh, limits robust performance. Uh, the first is knowledge. Uh, anyone who works in this space will tell you that the first time you take a well-studied system and use it to build a synthetic biology, whatever, the first thing you learn is that there are new things to learn about that well-studied system. And I think we heard a brilliant one, again, from Katie this morning about just uh, multiple transcriptional units. There's a lot to be learned when you start interrogating this way. So knowledge and maybe the unknown unknowns are, are oftentimes a key part of what limits performance. The second, um, as Dominic nicely introduced this morning, was that burden is a um, reality 
of any engineered circuit, and probably any natural circuit as well. And so burden can be in terms of the resources on a cell, burden can be framed in terms of the competition between different natural and synthetic bits. Remember, my motivation that I posed for using cells is that cells do useful things. We're trying to control them. You don't want your engineered control of those useful processes to disrupt the utility. And so another reason to think about burden, and we heard a lot about that earlier. Um, and the last one I'll focus in on today is the idea of variation. And so variation is something that, of course, we all know exists in any system, um, any biological system, but probably any small system exists a substantial amount of variation. And so the thread that I'll pull on today is just how do we acknowledge these um, aspects of what limits performance, and especially how do we think about variation in a way that can guide the design we do today, rather than just something we hope doesn't mess everything up in the long run. So I'll zoom in a little bit on this thought about variation and the connection to robust performance today. Q, few key reasons why this matters. So not only do we care about whether your design works as expected, but when we move this past the laboratory and into even an animal, let alone a clinical trial, let alone a manufactured product, variation becomes tantamount, becomes tantamount to feasibility in many different ways. Safety, efficacy, manufacturing, manufacturability, regulatory concerns, all are tied intrinsically to variation. And so these are all good reasons to think about variation from the get-go and maybe as part of what we need to think of in the beginnings of our design process. So this question, how should we deal with variation? There are many probably different answers for doing with this. One answer is to implement control, to control variation, reduce variation through engineered control along the themes of this meeting. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate some of the important points that were brought up in the earlier discussion and that control comes with a cost. Um, and so control, if applied to increasingly complex systems, may be too much of a cost for that system to be feasible. The other is that something that um, process controls will teach us is that having many controllers actually makes prediction harder sometimes because of interactions between controllers and between controlled substances, for example, within a chemical plant. It's one of the major safety limitations right now of modern chemical processes is interactions between controlled subunits, um, which are hard to predict. And so control is, I think, part of the answer here, but I think intelligent choice of when we need control is what we decided earlier was the way to do this. And so when we don't use control, what else can we use to get to this idea of robust performance? And so I'm not presenting an alternative, but rather a complement to, I think, that perspective with some of the answers I'll pose here today. So one is in a very pragmatic way, maybe we can just design parts that are inherently more robust. And when I say robust, I mean robust to variations in things like expression level, cell state, uh, and, and other contributors to context. So in our hands, we try to manifest this with a, a simple pivot from our initial synthetic receptor design, where we did some work to figure out essentially what was giving rise to um, the fact that our receptors were sensitive to things like expression level. There was too much on a 2D surface of a cell. We got spontaneous signaling, and then you had high background and low fold induction. And after figuring out where that came from, we identified a point in the mechanism where if we were able to switch it to a different mechanism, we could hopefully reduce that um, limitation and get better performance. So in this case, the cartoon is very similar, except when the receptor dimerizes, we reconstitute a split version of this protease and that leads to the initiation of downstream signaling. And that's just based on the idea that transient diffusive contact in the membrane is unavoidable for receptor systems. So we wanted to make that next step slow and this reconstitution was the idea. And the first thing we found that as soon as we built this, everything got worse. They always signaled, they signal no matter what, they just were always on. And part of the reason was this split protein was um, derived in a very different system. And after digging into it, we realized that in general for split protein systems, this is a challenge where the assay in which you select a variant of a split protein very much limits the applications to which that split protein is well suited. So in this case, uh, the screen had been done in a soluble context in the 3D environment of the cytoplasm of the cell, and that contact frequency is lower than when you tether those same protein domains to a membrane. So we needed a way to make this appropriate for a membrane. And it just turns out there's no uh, established methodology for doing that kind of adaptation or tuning without returning back to doing a screen. So we teamed up with Watson Raman for the University of Wisconsin, who is an expert in many things, including computational protein design, to see if we could use computational analysis to streamline the refinement of the split protein to work in this new application. So in this uh, paper, which I'll just summarize in a couple of slides, 
we developed an algorithm called SPORT, uh, a split protein optimization uh, for constitution uh, for, for tuning. And the general idea for how this works is that we use the Rosetta platform, which is great for analyzing protein physics. And we took our split protein and analyzed all the residues of the interface, identified all those mutations that could be mutated without changing the predicted overall stability of that protein in water. And then we considered different types of mutations that would have um, a trade-off between increasing the total energy of the protein, which is bad and might lead to instability, with increasing the interfacial energy, which should make reconstitution a little bit harder without necessarily breaking the protein. And we didn't know how much we needed to tune that, and so we explored along this unknown axis of interface or energy. And the idea would be there should be hopefully some sweet spot, some Goldilocks zone, where you could make reconstitution harder, but not impossible, without breaking the protein. What we showed in this study is that by doing that and avoiding things like um, the catalytic triad in terms of where we position the mutations, we were able to generate an experimental landscape that looks a lot like this cartoon here. So I'm really jumping to the end of the story here. And we showed that indeed, with our fairly crudely drawn cartoon I introduced in the last slide here, there is good experimental evidence that that does a decent job of describing reality. There's sort of a pocket in the bottom right-hand corner here where the green dots show that our um, split protein receptors, which were initially not inducible, can be made inducible by dialing up the interfacial energy and avoiding um, things that break it. There are a lot of other solutions that exist besides that pocket, I should say, but the point is, if you were to only look in this area here, you have a very high chance of actually finding one that works. So you can look at the frequencies here for the inducible, for example, we're able to get a pretty good um, probability of pulling out an inducible mutation from the location that's associated with those inducible mutations. So this is kind of nice and suggesting the problem is feasible. This concept is useful. Back to an operational level, we showed that this um, method also lets us make some really high-performing synthetic receptors. So here I'm just showing our initial receptors, which show no change upon ligand, and the final ones, which show really beautiful fold inductions upon the induction of ligand. So not only can we tune things, but that can be used to make these high-performing receptors. That is the exciting take home for this paper. That is kind of how we've used this. But for the sake of today's talk, I'm gonna highlight this other figure, which I think is in the supplement, where we just try to see when did these break. We expressed the chain under all the conditions that we knew broke our first generation of receptors. Different total expression levels, different ratios of the different chains. And the overall answer that's hard to see here is that our wild type systems sort of never work under those scanning our highly evolved or highly optimized receptors, they just work across all those different conditions. They're no longer finicky to expression level or ratio between the different proteins here. And so that's what we mean when we say robust receptors. So this was an exciting story because it's just that this concept of inherently robust parts has promise and we have a way of doing it here. So if we return back to our cartoon here, that gave us confidence that we were ready to take on um, challenges using those sensors. Uh, in the meantime, we were also looking at the next step here, which is the need to come up with new ways of doing information processing. And so we, when we started working on this in particular, there were a few well-studied systems, um, TET repressor-based system, GAL4-based system, and a few pioneering studies in other um, non-mammalian contexts, but nothing that really comprised the palette we could use in mammalian cells at the time. So we looked at some inspiration from some early work that uh, Mo Khalil's group did with Jim Collins, building synthetic transcription factors in yeast. And in this case, these zinc figure motifs that we explored are akin to the smallest transcription factors you'll find in nature. These three zinc figure motifs are a pretty good argument for the minimal element of what comprises transcription factor and transcription factor um, sets within nature. And so we initially just built a set of promoters and transcription vector variants, varying the things you would vary if you would um, go about doing this in terms of where the binding sites are, how they are positioned relative to the transcriptional start site. And, and the very first level of this was just to build that characterization data set. And uh, so we found first that we had a large three or four order of magnitude range of states that we can access um, using this approach. I'm not showing it in this slide deck here, but we did also verify that those things that those sets that work well when delivered by transient transfection also work well when integrated into the genome. So these are not limited to one context or another in that sense. Um, but I think more importantly than this characterization type of work we did in this study is we also built a model 
to help us understand how to use these four designs. And to the theme of this overall session, I'll highlight that aspect of the story. Within the same paper, we took this overall characterization and tried to first use models to explain why all those different choices resulted in different outcomes here. And I just wanted to zoom in a little bit to explain how that works for folks who don't do this kind of work um, routinely. So the first we showed is that the circles here are experimental data points. And if you looked at different types of promoter designs, either spaced out binding sites or compact, you looked at different dosages of the transcription factor and the number of binding sites for transcription factor, we get these two very different shapes here depending on which um, system we're looking at. By building a series of mathematical models that were really just posed based upon kind of standard ways in which gene expression can work in different systems, we generated a large library of simulations where in this case, we have not fit any model to any data yet. We're just looking at a large variety of parameter space and uh, several different models um, that can describe whether, for example, DNA binding is cooperative or not cooperative, which we suspect it might be involved here. And when we did this, we found that when looking at the resulting simulations, the shapes all fell into one of four categories. And if you look at the shapes of these curves and match the shape of their data, only one of those families um, matches up with their data set. And in that case, it surprised us in the sense that there was no evidence for cooperativity at the level of DNA binding, but rather cooperativity at the level of recruiting RNA polymerase or cofactors seems to be the best explanation consistent with our data here. And then with those models, we can of course fit the model to the data and that's what you see with the splines that are going through the data points on the left here. So the key point here is that one way in which modeling can really help in any one of these systems is to help build new insights into why what you're seeing can be useful. And I think folks at this, at this meeting are perhaps well convinced of that benefit. The next thing we tried to do was to see whether or not we could do something more like was, was mentioned at Domitilla's introduction talk, which is predictive design of systems. And so the, the um, really signature achievement in this space was done by Alec Nielsen, Doug Densmore, and Chris Voigt um, about six years ago when they uh, reported the cello, the cello technology and I wanted to just actually mention a key couple of things that were cool about this story um, beyond just the overall achievement. So the first is that this was an exercise in trying to see if you, how far can you push the mapping of conceptual achievements from one discipline into another. So the fact that you can describe, uh, it's also where I learned that transistors are analog and not digital in some ways. And so the analog nature of a transistor and the analog nature of a genetic logic um, gate are actually um, arise from the same underlying description. They, they can be described by the same mathematics. And that means that, for example, the reason why digital circuits are digital is we hook them up in a way where they act digital. And that was the insight here is maybe we can do the same thing with these genetic circuits. They are analog. Maybe we can connect them in a way where they act digital and get these um, overall complex circuits to work, as well as leveraging some design tools um, derived from circuit design that I won't uh, go into too much today. So a couple of key things in this story is that initially this didn't work nearly as well as they hoped it would. And upon in, uh, investigation, they realized a couple of things uh, that were necessary to get this to work as well as it did. The first is there were some new biological details about how these different parts worked. They needed to add those to their models in order to capture what's actually happening in their system. You can see from these histograms here in this portion of the figure that they had incorporated an explicit description of variation. Those histograms are variation within the population. And there was a necessity to avoid things like overburdening the cell in order for those circuits to work. So same three kind of cartoons I had earlier were necessary to get to this design achievement in Cello. And so we decided to see if we could do the same thing with our minimal transcription factors based on those zinc fingers called Comet in a story we reported last year. And I'll just kind of summarize what we went about doing and how we think that has some important lessons for going forward. So um, the first is that we uh, um, started with, as a design goal, some um, logical circuits based upon Boolean logic. Key, key point about why that is a useful starting point sometimes. One uh, motivation is that many of the insights we have from immunology and from therapeutic design are indeed Boolean statements. What we know about what distinguishes a cancer cell from a healthy cell can be framed as a Boolean statement. A lot of times the way that we come up with design statements, they fit very nicely into this. Not everything, but many things do. The other thing is that this is one of those spaces where the gap still requires a human. Going from a design statement to a whiteboard diagram of what parts might exist 
that can be uh, leveraging all we know from systems biology because we have this existing knowledge base that does this. And so that's another reason why we focus on that space there. And all of the rest of this cartoon is showing is that given the model, how the parts work, and this way of mapping a design statement into a candidate design, what we did is then, instead of building things and seeing how they work, we simulated many possible ways of going through this um, exercise and only built designs that were predicted to work well. And I'll show you what that means. So one of the first things we showed was this kind of an AND gate here, which you can represent in various ways. You could build this with these kind of um, chemical parts, biochemical parts, where in this case we have an in team mediated splicing of two components to hit an activator onto a DNA binding domain. And we um, then simulated how well this thing would work um, in the context of a transfection. So one of the one of the things that I'll highlight in these diagrams is that these heat maps down here are a way of evaluating how your circuit performs across expression space. And so here we're showing it projected into the expression uh, levels of two different components, but you can do this at a higher dimension as well. And this is just showing that our comet system with a few new biochemical parts can be fit to that old model with just adding in some descriptions of those new uh, in this case, NT mediated splicing here. So the experiment fits the data, and also we can capture the way variation uh, impacts performance across the landscape. So that's just fitting, not predicting. With that in hand, we tried to do some predictions using an analogous approach here. And so here we're trying to build an imply gate. And what we did is come up with a lot of different ways where you might build an imply, simulate them through our model that describes variation in the population. And then we really didn't do anything experimentally until we came up with something that looks kind of like this, where you see a lot of function that seems to work across the expression landscape. Because we know that we're wrong, and we know that we can't really control expression all that well, so the most useful designs will be the ones that don't uh, rely upon working really well in a really hard to access way. So at the end of that story, we ended up with a lot of circuits that look kind of like this, and I'll summarize those results in just a moment here. But we also wanted to see if we can go past things like Boolean logic to other things we want to build. We're getting to other types of capabilities. So we can build an activation gate. So this is like if you have a reporter construct and it doesn't turn on very well, you'd like it to turn on more, we can do that. We can also convert a um, linear response into an ultra sensitive response, which is sort of like converting an analog output into a more digital output. And each one of these cases, the point was the same, that we only built those constructs that were predicted to work across um, a fairly wide regime of the way we were doing gene delivery. And so what um, I'll highlight here at the end here is looking at complexity of the resulting things. So one way of looking at these results is to say, we're able to build these circuits that are of half a log to a log greater complexity than anything that had been reported before. Um, I think another way to think about that is based upon a comment that Tisuk mentioned earlier today, which is that it's important to remember that complexity is not the goal. What we actually were trying to figure out is when does our ability to do predictive design break? And one of the surprises was we could get to complexities beyond what we really are trying to use right now, and it doesn't break as long as you keep in mind those things that give rise to the ability to predict. And I think that's probably the most important take home lesson here is that we as a field are getting closer to understanding the things that make prediction hard. And that the more we can carve those out, we should be able to do predictive design um, at greater complexities. And maybe that is not the immediate goal, but it certainly talks, certainly um, suggests that there's a big frontier out there. So I think this is a pretty good fictional GUI describing where we are with some of these bits in the sense that we now as a field have a lot of parts. We have a pretty good understanding about how some of them work. Um, and I think right now, one another big challenge though, is that it still relies upon the creativity of the designer to come up with the design that executes the function that you're hoping to do. So the opportunities for doing things like automated design are really um, timely in this particular space. I'm gonna add with just three kind of, um, three or so given forward looking bits here to kind of help um, tee up some conversation here. Um, the first is this idea that our um, computational approach that we are using in this approach is actually kind of hard to do. Uh, even for synthetic biologists and even for folks who do modeling, it's kind of hard to do modeling in a way that actually gets you to some of those utilities I promised here. We benefited a ton from collaborating with experts in computational analysis and applied mathematicians. One thing we wanted to do is make it possible for relative neophytes, graduate students who are interested in getting involved, to jump in and be able to do that much faster here. And so 
we developed this paper called Games, which is really a tutorial as much as anything that um, helps understand how to do this and has a lot of really accessible Python code to get up to speed very quickly on the process of doing modeling design. Um, we also implemented this in a class and have a pedagogical piece that uh, I am trying to submit by Friday uh, for broader publication. If you're interested in teaching this kind of a topic, there are some slides and things that can help to make this part of a, a curriculum focused on doing modeling in synthetic biology. The second is that I wanted to come back to this comment that was raised earlier, that doing design in one cell type doesn't necessarily let it work in another cell type. And in particular, we've been working on this for a long time when thinking about challenges like how do you do experiments quickly where trans transient transfection might be appropriate, but then use that to do something you want to do, which might be stable genetic expression within a primary cell. How do you cross those gaps? How will that limit the ability to do efficient design, for example? So we have a story that we're hoping to uh, share pretty soon here, where we've explored that in a truly systematic fashion. And the idea here is that if you can understand how those gaps look, you can actually streamline the way you go about examining the deployment stage as well. For example, here we're thinking if you had a circuit and you were deciding whether to implement it with a transposon or a lentivirus, can we use this idea of context and the overall expression landscape to help streamline the design of a circuit that will work well when deployed with the method of interest in the cell type of interest? That's a good long-term goal, but there's a lot of promise that this is actually uh, the right way to go about thinking about this. Um, we've used this also in some interesting ways where we've taken these circuits out of model cell lines into things like um, uh, animal models. And one of the cool things there is that you can start to see in this space this idea of uh, first version trial all the way through an animal trial, see a limitation. You can go back to the drawing board quickly, iterate the design and come up with different versions that, for example, give better performance in this case with a uh, hypoxia responsive uh, biosensor. And that's really exciting to see that that loop is getting bigger and bigger in terms of what we can do as a space here. And finally, I just wanted to make another plug for the same review article that, uh, that Katie mentioned in the previous talk here. Uh, that is the idea of looking at the level of control we have access to or focus on here uh, expanding. And so one of the things I'll highlight connected to this talk is that everything I've been telling you about so far is transcriptional control at the level of activators. But of course, there are many other levels of control where having these kind of parts could be very useful. And in particular, cr controlling things like the local epigenetic state, controlling chromatin are a very exciting frontier and are probably going to be necessary for doing things like circuits that have stable states and for doing things like circuits that exhibit long-term dynamics. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to see. That's where everyone is um, interested right now. And I, I think we'll see a lot of great progress in this space in coming years. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to end there. And I think I'm just about on the beam to hand this over to uh, Germont for the final summary. But I hope I've inspired you a bit with the idea that prediction is possible. It is hard. It is not a solved problem. But it's a place where you can make an immediate contribution on many, many frontiers discussed at the meeting today. And I'll thank everybody here who um, contributed to this paper. The names are the folks who um, contributed to the various stories here today, as well as our funders for these stories. Thanks for your attention. I'm handing it over to Germont for our breakout summary. Yeah, if you can just go to the next slide. Yeah, that's great. So at our breakout session, it's um, it's as it as it shows. We we discuss the impact of uh, of modeling and how critically important. Uh, it is, especially at the therapeutic level. We also kind of went over the definitions because that was something that, that I think everyone has a different definition of synthetic biology. So we talked about that control theory, systems biology, and how it feeds on each other and how they're all interrelated. So if you go to the next uh, slide, Josh, the basically what happened is the discussion actually just generated a lot of questions. Um, for example, you know, when you're building a model, there's still a lot of data that you don't know um, that there's a lot of data you don't know that you need. So how do you ensure that you have the data in order to have um, a correct model? And there was an example of not including a feature in the model caused error propagation down the line. So again, this has been talked about throughout, I think all the topics is complexity. When you add complexity to gene circuits, you know, how, how do you balance um, the, you add, sorry, when you add, when you add, um, when you're looking for control, you're adding complexity. 
So what's the optimum balance in complexity and control? So this has been talked about uh, throughout all the, the, the talks so far. Another interesting point is um, uh, nature uses mutation and evolution. So where are we putting this in modeling? Um, and uh, again, finally, the, the burden. I think we've talked about this uh, for everything. You know, adding a gene circuit into something isn't free. You know, how do we model and account for this, um, this, this feature? Okay, if you go to the next slide. So um, we, we did additional discussions of, about how, how biology controls cells and how we engineer cells. And again, this has been kind of the, the context of, of today's talk. You know, the biological controls and mechanism are complicated and they're intensive. And if you remember, Domatilla put temperature control on hers on her slides. And then if you look, you know, in a factory per se, you know, if you need to do something like keep your coffee hot, you can just engineer um, a, a PID temperature device. And that's a little less complex and a little energy less intensive. And the final thing was, you know, how does, how does biology control, um, the differences in control from biology and engineered systems. And again, the topics were, were talked about. Um, biology is a long time scale and it's multiple levels of control. For engineering, it's static, it's a short time scale. And I think the Domatilla said the short time scale of a graduate student um, and, and it's single path. Okay, if you go to the final slides, we, we talked about some discussions. Um, one of the thing, uh, we, we talked about some uh, future discussions and gaps. One of the comments was, can you um, develop some sort of generic design rules, a general uh, circuit design for, um, for the work that we're doing? Um, again, complexity is a big challenge. How are we gonna work through that? And um, I think the last two items, what's the minimum amount of work to move one gene circuit from one chassis to another? You know, these are, these are uh, questions that I think we all have. And the final thing is um, with all the comments uh, from, from all of the breakouts and, and the discussions today, of course, we need more tools and we need more information and, and um, especially in mammalian cell, uh, cell design. So with that, I can um, open it up to questions. I think there's one in the chat. So um, just curious to know that using these techniques, is it possible to design a completely novel transcription factor which can recognize new series of ligands? Yeah, I, uh, thanks Rahita. So that, um, that's a great question. I mean, of course, there's a lot of work trying to do things like this in both microbial systems and mammalian systems. And I would just highlight a couple of cool things in this mammalian synthetic transcription factor space. So some recent work coming out of Mo Khalil's group as uh, with some collaborators, as well as some stuff that, um, that we did shows you can do that. Um, what oftentimes is the um, strategy is to take something that already exists to confer small molecule control, for example, small molecule inhibition or activation of a uh, protease, small molecule induced dimerization or uh, change in DNA binding states, for example, like the TET system. And the, the, uh, the general answer is that those kind of uh, functionalities can be adopted onto all these kind of modular parts. And for the most part, they give you pretty good orthogonal control with some limitations. I think one of the things that anyone who uses these synthetic systems um, has experienced something on these lines where sometimes the most potent transcription factors are the most problematic transcription factors in the sense that having many, many different activation domains can lead to not only burden, but things like toxicity and interaction that are different. And so one of the things that is, um, that is interesting is to see when you start building these multi-component type regulatory units, you have to be uh, particularly attuned to those kind of challenges. Um, they are solvable, but they are an important feature of what makes the generation of novel systems um, more or less useful, more or less expedient. And I guess just in particular, if you're building one of these yourself, it's useful to start from the get-go and imagining that palette as being pretty large and looking at not just the things that are strongest, but the, um, a whole range of things. And kind of, again, back to this idea that when we talk about transcription, there are multiple steps involved in that transcription initiation. And um, when you're looking at, for example, multigenic arrays, you may care about 
this promoter interference in a way that's different than if you're trying to crank out just one transgene in a biomanufacturing context. Um, I was trying to come up with a good metaphor between Katie's talk and now, and I didn't do it, but I was thinking you're much more likely to rear end someone on the freeway if you're always driving around at 90 miles an hour than if you're moving along at like 25 miles an hour. And so you can kind of pick the design of your transcription factors to fit into one of those regimes, depending on what you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to do. And Don Matilla's comment, I'll just go ahead and respond to that one as well. Yeah, it's 100% correct. Every model is wrong because it always misses some part of the system. The question is which model is um, missing to capture the parts that are not relevant to address the question the model should address, right? All, this is kind of George Box's famous quote, all models are wrong, some are useful. The modeling objective drives the type of model that's required here. And there's probably a good parallel for the application of that model towards design. Um, but I think that's a good point and that you don't need perfect knowledge to do explanation and you probably don't need uh, perfect knowledge to do prediction in this kind of design capacity either. Thanks, Lila. Great. Um, thanks. Great question um, from Herbert. Um, one question in modeling work, do you use best practice techniques developed in systems biology, for example, standard modeling formats? This enhances reproducibility and the ability for researchers to build on existing work. A uh, recent preprint did a study showing that modeling papers in systems biology, the usage standards are more cited because the work is much easier to reuse and build upon. Yeah, I, I, we, we have toyed with that. I will say it's a kind of a somewhat answer. And I think the reason is, so I teach a class on computational biology and make a big pitch for exactly the point being made here and that this ability of to, in particular, reproduce and build upon the work of others is a huge benefit of using some of these standard um, methodologies uh, that have been developed by like SBML3 and the kind of um, standard markup languages developed collectively by the community. And I think we've, we've attempted this in a couple of cases and run into issues doing it that way. We have tried to capture the spirit in terms of like standardizing the way in which the model is communicated, but I think even more so the way that the model development process is reported in the work. So, so this is a key thing that we tried to highlight in the games bit, which I think is a, it's a no because answer in some ways here in that we often found what's hardest in our hands to try to take advantage of stuff that exists is that if the model development process wasn't clear, we don't actually know to what extent we can, um, where we're starting with essentially taking those previous works. And there's been some nice work showing that, for example, models, and I, I know you know this, but this other folks maybe not haven't seen this, but one of the big challenges with um, many reported models is that the parametric uncertainty is not necessarily evaluated in a way where you can decide whether the um, model identifiability matches the data that was used in order to characterize and generate that data. So we've leaned more on that kind of applied mathematician way of thinking about the utility of the model and its documentation. But um, yeah, I'd really love to talk to you. This offer to kind of follow up on standardization would be really, really excited to have that follow-up conversation. Great. Thanks a lot. Thought you might want to hear my voice. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I appreciate it. I do. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Ned McGarry is your colleague and co-author in that story too. So that's another great way we can connect. Okay, let's we can end it here. Uh, thanks, Josh, for a, for a great talk. Okay, super. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Marcela Gomez, who is from uh, UC Santa Cruz Department of Applied Mathematics. Her research interests uh, are synthetic and systems biology, and like like the rest, she'll provide a update on our current work and a summary of the uh, 6th December breakout, uh, biological, oh, biocontrol methods to complex biological systems. Okay, I will pass it over to um, Marcella. Thanks, Jermont. Um, so I can go ahead and share my screen. And I realized that I'm about to be competing with an exciting match between France and Morocco. So I appreciate everyone's attention um, for as long as I can sustain it. Yeah, so I will be giving a little bit of a talk around my current research and accelerating wound closure through feedback control. And of course, following that with the breakout discussion, um, co-led with Eric uh, Johnson at the NIH, um, focused around scaling up biocontrol methods to complex biological systems. And so these views are mine uh, and mine alone and do not represent any other agency, including the NIH. <clears throat> 
And also, um, I have no financial relationship that is relevant to the subject matter of the presentation. So the, the recent development of bioelectronic sensors and, and bioelectronic actuators are really opening up the doors for an unprecedented level of, of control and ability to sense and respond to biological uh, systems. And uh, so there's potential for this to help in advancing precision medicine through feedback control. Um, and, and the state of the art in precision medicine right now is really looking at static factors such as um, genomics, possible mutations um, to predict outcomes or, or, historic, or historical data. And, and so the application that I focus on uh, integrating bioelectronic sensors and actuators for feedback control right now is around accelerating wound healing. And so, and this is a, a project DAR funded by DARPA and the, the goal is very simple. And this is kind of part of like their, their new approach, um, setting high level targets. And the goal is, simp is, is simply to reduce the wound closure time by 50%. So not a simple task, um, but uh, a very concise, I, I guess, a direct target goal. And so there's a lot of, um, so we've, you know, we, we've looked at feedback control at the genetic level. And so it's a very different talk um, where we're thinking about feedback control with an external loop, right? So now what we're trying to do is drive cellular behavior or system behavior um, simply by manipulating the environment. So, basically, so essentially leveraging the fact that, system, that biological systems always sense and respond to their environment. And we strategically control the environment in order to drive um, essentially their behavior towards some targeted behavior. Um, and, ob and obviously some complications come up when you start to scale, um, when you start to scale up because your, your, your sensing and your actuation are gonna vary across very um, spatial temporal scales, right? So in wound healing, there's four canonical stages. We have hemostasis and the inflammation stage, proliferation stage and remodeling. And it, but if you look at the right hand side, like although the we like tend to discrete these into four bins, um, it's actually a sequence of of coordinate highly coordinated uh, biological processes, right? That involve different uh, cell types in each stage, and of course these stages are also overlapping. And then in the end, our goal is an outcome, um, which has yet to be quantified, right? yet our control actions are affecting single cell behavior. And so mapping that single cell behavior to an overall outcome is really the challenge in creating this feedback. So in general, we can, we can this is a high level schematic of what that feedback architecture, control architecture might look like. Um, so we have, you know, the devices on the left and the right um, essentially are the same device. So you can think of this as a, as a feedback path. And these devices are also interface with your biological system. So we've worked from with in vitro systems to, um, to mice to now to pig models. And so currently we're limited in what we can sense. So we can sense um, the current that's the readout of the devices. And we also have a camera on board so we can take images and use those images to assess the state of the wound. And then based on the information of, of uh, where we are, basically in the progression of the wound healing, we carry out some control algorithm that then decides how we should actuate in real time the device in order to further um, direct cellular response, or in this case, tissue response of, of the wound. And at the same time, um, we need to think about developing an interface for physicians so that they can have an understanding of what is happening and also have some control, some I guess, overarching control of, of, um, of the, the treatments to be applied to the wound. And this is mostly for, for safety and also for essentially gaining the, the confidence of the physicians for application and translational work. And so on the, on the uh, control level, we necessitate a multi-layer control. And so at the bottom you can see here's a, a wound, this is a mouse wound. Um, the actuators are, are what's delivering some treatment to the wound in the form of either a a drug or an electric field, and the sensors are, are sensing the response. So again, that could just be an RGB image. Um, we can also consider images of fluorescent um, dyes that may report out, say, pH or other indicators of the wound state. 
And then the low level controller here works to essentially make sure that the actuation device is, is um, operating appropriately, delivering um, drugs at the, at the concentrations that we need um, in order to achieve our high level goals. But then the high level goals really need to be made um, at the planner and like decision making level. And so this is just the, this is the approach that we take in order to break down something that's very complex into much simpler components where we can borrow tools um, from existing fields and controls. So this is an, so one of the, I think that one of the primary challenges initially when we started this project was really like, how do we quantify, quantify the, you know, the, basically the state of the system and how do we create a metric for the outcome of the system? Uh, and so, like we said, like, uh, in, um, clinicians like understand their understand that there are four wound healing stages, um, yet mathematically they're not really defined, right? Nor are they defined by any metrics by any measurable states. And so one of the first things we did was actually just to take a time series of images, and we had these essentially like a an interface for that we sent out to a, a set of experts and non-experts, and then had them label the images just based on their understanding of visual indicators and cues for each of the four stages, hemostasis, inflammation, um, proliferation, maturation. And so what's interesting is that the results actually aligned um, for both experts and non-experts with, with the understood progression of a wound healing. So we see the, the blue curve represents hemostasis. It's really high in the beginning. Then it decays down. Um, the next curve to uptick is the inflammation curve um, in red, which peaks around day three. It then begins to come down. And then we see inflammation peak up as soon as, or inflammation pick up as soon as, sorry, proliferation. We see proliferation um, upregulate as soon as we see inflammation start to downregulate. And finally, in the late stages, we see maturation. Um, so, so this was, uh, this, this was interesting, although not really, um, I say rigorous since it was just image based, but in in the clinical setting, this is in fact why they what they go by just um, essentially visual observations and also um, tracking the wound size over time. So we but we wanted to ground this um, this in more in something that we can measure biologically, and so we also we also thought about how we might define wound healing stages using transcriptomic data. And so we look for differentially expressed genes. Um, and, as, and as you can imagine, um, many genes may be correlated because they may be upregulated together or may be driving one another. And so with that knowledge, you know, we look for essentially the, the ones that, more, that were like clearly most upregulated or downregulated and then clustered those genes based on their temporal dynamics. And so if we take those clusters of genes and just find the average um, temporal trajectory of that cluster, we can, we can then create like some n-dimensional system, and then we can visualize uh, the wound healing progression as essentially a trajectory in this n-dimensional system. And so it's the combination of the transcriptomic profile that really determines like where you are in the wound healing stage meaning that there isn't one biomarker that is sufficient to tell them because of the complexity of wound healing and all the states that are and all the um, and all the states that are involved and their overlap there isn't a single state that or a single gene that biomarker that we can look at that is a definitive indicator rather we need a combination of biomarkers and not their not their absolute expression but rather their expression relative to each other in order to understand where we are and so on the right-hand side, we can see projections on the two-dimensional space. And so just, this is just to highlight, again, the separability um, in some planes and then the lack of separability of the stages in other planes. And we'll see this soon with some real data. So actually, this one is, is um, applying the same concept to uh, three, three publicly available transcriptomic data sets. And so I have to I have to mention that we were very limited in the amount of time series data that we can find, um, and so they varied across from mouse to human to burn to surgical wounds for both for both mice and human. And so we're highlighting this three right now because these are the ones that we use for um, a subset of this data for for training of our models. 
Um, but these, you know, these are normalized average gene expression in um, for respective non-overlapping gene clusters. And so we see that overall, like there is a general trend. Um, although we see that in cluster three, um, the surgical wounds seem to um, have a much higher uptick of inflammation or stronger inflammatory response compared to the burn wounds. But it's unclear because again, you know, we don't have that fine resolved temporal resolution in our data. So there's remains a lot of question marks, but in general, it's good to see that we understood like, well, you know, all these wounds go through the four canonical wound healing stages, yet no um, literature has been able to quantitatively show that to be true. So we were able to I, we were able to find a total of like five data sets. Um, the, the three on the top are the are the ones that I showed in the previous slide, and then we were able to add two more uh, for testing as well. Um, because one of the criteria is we needed the unwounded state as a reference, or essentially at initial time of wounding, and then some at least like two data points after that. So in order to be considered a time series. So overall, um, in our in our ML based model, we have 16 data points um, that we used for training, and those were essentially one of the three replicates from the data from the first three data sets. Um, and we also did this, you know, we also did cross validation as well, um, holding out each of the replicates um, for training at separate in separate training sessions. And then the, the remaining replicates and the additional two data sets were used for testing, and these were a total of 69 data points. And so I should mention we use support vector machine as our ML-based model because that really um, is the most suitable for uh, systems when you have small data sets. And so here's the five data sets um, corresponding to their to their to their labels. Sorry, so I also mentioned like we we labeled the in order to to train and to um, test the performance of the model, we we labeled the data points um, with a stage according to um, information like the time points, what was written in the in, in the literature in terms of you know sometimes they say like okay we took day two because that's when we expect inflammation or even looking at um, some of key biomarkers for inflammation or other known um, biomarkers for specific processes. Um, so here's like all those five data sets with data points, sorry, from the, from the five data sets um, and the color of, of the point corresponds to, um, to the stage. And so again, it's just, you know, projecting, we have, in this case, we have a, a five-dimensional um, state but we're projecting onto two-dimensional systems like just to show in some planes, we can see some separability between some groups of stages. And um, so essentially we can, can leverage the, the different projections. And so using an algorithm, again, leveraging this um, support vector machine, which essentially identifies the opt optimal hyperplanes or essentially, you know, separating or, sur you know, surfaces separating the, uh, separating the, the clustered groups of, of the wound healing stages. Um, so we saw that, you know, here in this plot on the right, a one-to-one -one correspondence indicates the correct stage classification. Um, and so we saw that most of the misclass or the misclassified points were in the remodeling stage. And what's interesting is that either they were predicted to be the stage before it, which is proliferation, and given the overlap, we can understand as well that um, the boundaries between the, the wound stages is not um, as black and white, right? And then the model is assuming that they are. And then the other interesting thing is that some were misclassified as hemostasis. But this makes sense because actually we should expect that once the wound is closed, that the transcriptomic profile should look very much close to the initial um, state of the skin before the or at exactly at the time of wounding. And so with the cross-validation, um, the error ranged from 4 to 16%. And then using a, a completely independent set of data that we generated in-house, um, we, we essentially compared the gene-based model to our optical um, biopsy-based 
model predictions. Um, but that's just the, the image based model, but that's a fancy way to say it. Um, and so we see that uh, for day zero, those were um, maybe trivially, <laughs> trivially uh, identified as the initial wounding stage um, in both the image base and the initial. Um, and then day one was designated inflammation by the gene-based model. And then days two to seven were already designated as proliferation in the gene-based model. But as you can see that we don't really receive any um, substantial visual cues until day three or four. So we wonder if this is still correct in the sense of that the genes begin to, to um, be upregulated, right? But then there's some delay uh, until we actually enough, you know, enough progress is made to see the visual indicators of, of the proliferation. Okay, so that was the, our description of, of the work done for the wound stage classification, which um, uh, ends up being a really an, an essential component of even starting to think about applying feedback control. And so now I'm going to go into like our, essentially what happens after that. How do we use that information of where we are in the wound and map that um, to how we control the device. And so I didn't think I'll be able to go into too many layers of for the multi-layer controller, but um, just give you a high level view of things we've been working on because we don't have like one definitive answer, but rather um, trying different architectures and different approaches. But essentially we wanna take this, you know, this, this wound state assessment of where we are in the wound healing trajectory um, feed that into a high-level planner, which is going to then tell us um, what we what the treatment strategy, um, suggested treatment strategy should be. So that is what is the desired drug concentration or the electric field strength to be applied. Um, and then once we know what, what needs to be delivered to the wound, um, this then goes into the low-level controller, which then directly interfaces with the bioelectronic devices, um, thereby figuring out what are the voltages that need to be applied to drive the devices in order to achieve um, the desired treatment signal that we want. And so that, that middle part is really the hardest part, um, using the state of the wound to track progression and suggest treatment strategies. Um, and that's the part where we've been working on methods that are leverage both our um, data-driven model of the wound healing stages, um, trying to map those to also a mechanistic model of wound healing. And this is a simple like five state OBE model. And since five clusters were enough dimensions to, to fully define the wound, the wound state, we assume that five ODEs are also sufficient enough to, to map to um, biological processes and essentially grouping many of the biological processes. So it's a very abstract model. Um, which then maps to single cell activity and behavior because we know how the drugs or electric field affect the system at the single cell level, but we don't know how that maps to the overall outcome of the system. And so here, like I said, we use a combination of data-driven mechanistic models um, and also um, been playing with some reinforcement learning methods, so machine learning methods to, to essentially leverage our our mechanistic model, since um, certainly we, we don't expect to get enough data from experiments to inform any reinforcement learning approaches or any deep learning approaches whatsoever. Um, so this is where we're trying to, to leverage the best of both worlds. Okay, and so for the, for the remaining of my talk, um, I'm gonna just focus on the low level control. Um, since I think this is, a, this is where we have made the most progress, um, and I would say not just us, but certainly there are other labs who have um, also carried out similar types of experiments. So all to say that, you know, this, this is the most advanced um, component of this project and in the, you know, state of the art of the field and can, and in its current state can leverage what we know about control theory. Um, and I would say the the former that I was speaking about is really where we need to think about how do we develop um, new formal methods for this for when we scale up complexity. So the low-level controller, as I mentioned, is, is really just focusing on executing the treatment strategies um, once we figure out what they should be and using feedback control on the direct current measurements of the bioelectronic device. So um, 
So we have our desired drug concentration or electric field strength. We can develop a static mapping that tells us essentially what current um, do we expect to be reading out on the device if that is what we're achieving. Um, and then we can essentially do, we can resort back to traditional um, feedback control algorithms to achieve the desired current that maps to our um, treatment strategy. And so the first example I'll talk about is one for um, interfacing with the device that delivers a drug known as zomotriptan. And so zomotriptan has been shown to affect innervation. Um, it's also been shown in vivo with mice to accelerate wound healing. Um, although in the clinical studies or say in vivo studies with the mice, um, just given the nature of the field, there's less understanding of the direct processes that it's targeting. Um, but nonetheless, so, you know, the way these devices work is that essentially you, by creating a differential, um, by applying differential voltages, um, you induce a current and that current is actually composed of these charged molecules. So uh, most, luckily most molecules seem to be charged. So as long as your molecule is charged in some way and small enough, then we can develop a bioelectronic device to deliver or remove um, th those, ion, those ions. Um, and so this one is for, as I mentioned, for zolmatriptan. Um, and so why, why the current? Um, that's the best readout we can do. When we apply voltages, we have no idea how much we're delivering. Um, but because when you're delivering the charged ions, it's, you know, it's the, the charged molecules that are inducing a current. Um, so we read out the current. Um, some of that current is obviously a fact as um, it's proportional to um, the motion, you know, the actual movement of, of our drug. Um, across across the do, the domain there, so um, so you know the experimentalists that, that that fabricate these devices can compute the pumping efficiency of these systems, and so for this particular device, the pumping efficiency is twenty five percent with a current of three hundred nanoamps. So then we can estimate that um, if we want to deliver one point five micromolars of zolmatriptan, um, then we need to uh, deliver for 10 minutes with, with a target current of 300 nanoamps. And so that's the, the goal of the next, and in the experiments that we'll show. Um, so it, 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 there hasn't been, I would say one feedback control algorithm that has worked for every setup that we've used. So we've actually had to just tailor it, like figure out like for this particular system with this particular um, temporal response or sorry, time scale of the response. Um, or predictability of the response, which is the best controller to use. And so for this particular example, we use a sliding mode controller. Um, and so this is this is uh, taking in the error between the 300 uh, nanoamp current that we want and what it's actually reading out in the device. And then based on that is determining what is the voltage that needs to be applied to the bioelectronic device in order to achieve that target goal. So these are three experimental outputs in which we are playing with the, um, the parameters of the controller, um, one of the gains on there. Um, and so in the first one, we see the gain was too large. So it's uh, we see that the control output on the voltage fluctuates a lot. Um, and also around the tracking error, you see that's very high. So this in general was, um, we adjusted that, um, tuned down the parameters a bit, and so we see we get a smoother signal on the voltage, um, but the time to converge is really, really slow because of how small those gain parameters are. And then finally, we get something in between, right? So not too hot, not too cold. Um, then there's a little bit of a trade-off in which we get fast convergence, but still some uh, fluctuations around the target. But I think what's really nice about biological systems is that because they are... Um, robust, I'm not sure that we need to be so concerned with getting the exact um, precision as we would with uh, more traditional applications and control theory. So it's good to start thinking about, you know, where we can be a little bit sloppy and where we can. So um, in some sense, we need to be precise and in other cases, in other senses, we don't as much. And also, I just wanted to highlight the three experiments to show that um, you know, even with any control method, there there is still some some tuning that has to 
that has to occur. So we have an additional example of low level controllers directing cellular response. Um, and this one is actually with, with uh, in vitro cells in the loop. Um, so the other one, we were just measuring fluorescence that was giving an indicator of the concentration of our drug. Um, but in this case, we have a, an external loop set up with a microscope. Um, and so we then we process the images directly, uh, essentially compare that to some reference or desired target behavior. And in this case, we use a neural network, um, you know, network-based controller. And then this driving the bioelectronic device, which then again um, drives the biological system. And so in this case, the sliding mode controller was no longer a good idea because the cellular systems act in very erratic ways and sometimes even change the response to the same input. Um, so we thought the neural network um, base controller is not trained offline, it's updated online, so it'll adapt um, its strategy if the cells adapt their response to an input. And so this was really the appeal of, of this neural network-based approach, um, is that it could figure out, essentially optimize its own performance as it sees, as it observes whether right, its, its um, strategy is working or not working. So yeah, so this this is just a um, it's just a single layer in neural networks. So nothing fancy. It's not deep learning. It's not multi layers. It's just one la one layer. Um, and so in theory, it's equivalent to a multi layer system. Um, essentially, you have this universal function approximation that comes along with it. And so in um, in this example, we applied it to. Um, controlling stem cell membrane potential. So we had a fluorescent reporter that um, its fluorescence correlates with the memory potential of the cell. And what we were affecting here um, with the bioelectronic devices is, is a pH of the environment. And that was done by either delivering or removing protons. Um, and so on the top right figure, you can see we easily achieved our target goal when it was uh, a steady state value there. Um, but doing a long term, because you know, for stem cell differentiation, the time scales are really long. Doing long term control um, was a bit more challenging. So here we have a time scale over 10 hours in which we're um, trying to increase the, the fluorescence here. And so the, the solid line indicates times um, when we turn the controller on and we try to achieve the target. And then the dash line is when the controller is off. And really, what we found is that. We couldn't be continuously stimulating the cells because if you push them to their, to their if you stress them out, you push them like you, you're essentially, you're, you're forcing them to adapt and, and respond in different ways, which then is counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. So um, these are things that would have been very difficult to integrate automatically into a cold control algorithm, but really just came from our intuition of working enough with these systems. So. Now, finding a way to formalize that sort of behavior and response to that behavior um, would be really interesting, mathematically speaking. Uh, another example is controlling cell migration. Um, so cells exhibit directional migration under an electric field, and this is known as galvanotaxis. So if there's no electric field, uh, you see this kind of random walk behavior that we're all familiar with. Um, if you apply an electric field, then they exhibit a directional migration, um, either um, from cathode to anode or anode to cathode. And surprisingly, this also depends on the cell type um, in which direction they'll migrate. And a lot of challenges with controlling cell migration, uh, you're controlling a whole population of cells, at least their average behavior. And they obviously all, I mean, there's a lot of variation, variability from cell to cell. Um, so there's a large sampling time. We cannot image them too frequently because this is like toxic. Uh, so all these things we had to deal with. Um, so we had the experimental setup where we can essentially control the electric field or the strength of the electric field apply. Um, but the way we do that is by a, a changing the um, voltages, but we can only read out the current. So again, I'm oh, sorry, we're up, we reading out. 
I'm sorry, like I forgot, we're we reading out the current, oh, the current, the, the, we're reading out the current, and um, this creates an electric field. We cannot read out the electric field. We can only read out um, the images tracking, tracking the cells. So we take these images from the microscope um, using an image, image analyzer. We essentially do some cell tracking. Um, again, it goes back to quantifying, right? If you need to set a target reference for the response of your biological system, we need a way to quantify it. And that's to say that there is no really right answer on how you quantify or create a metric for a goal or outcome that you want to achieve. Um, so sometimes it's a little bit arbitrary, but it um, does need to be thought out um, with some thought and care. And then um, think about the interpretation of that after. Um, so one of one of the common um, metrics that people use in the, in this field is one called directedness, which just has to do with like it's the essentially the angle of its migration trajectory in comparison to the to the um, to the x axis. And then we also define another metric on top of that called recruitment index, essentially um, comparing the number of cells. Um, that move to the anode versus the cathode um, over the um, divided by the entire number of, of cells. And in this case, we, we, we wanted to build and improve on the neural network based model because one of the biggest issues we have is saturation. And that's true for the bioelectronic devices. And that's true in general for, for genetic networks. There's saturation everywhere. So at some point, it doesn't matter how much you crank up the control input, it's not gonna do you any good. Um, so it's being able to adapt the control algorithms to be able to under to handle these situation um, so that they can operate properly. Um, so in this case, we took the, the same neural network um, based controller, which adapts itself again to changing system behavior. Um, but then we added an additional term in order to account for the fact that. Um, there were bounds on what the voltages are that, that, that could be applied to the device. And then these are the um, just two, two counts of, of these in vitro results with, the, with these macrophages. Sorry, I didn't mention the cell type there. M0 macrophages, so non-differentiated yet. Um, on the left is the machine learning algorithm. So the blue is our target. And then um, the red is the the, the measured metric based on the time series images that we got out. Um, and then just for the heck of it, we'd also try the PID algorithm. Um, although we say that we had a little bit more trouble with that because it did take some iterations of, of tuning the parameters on the PID. Um, so in, overall, I would say like the M algorithm is, is um, maybe has that advantage over the PID if it can be executed properly. Um, not to say that you can't eventually find a good set of parameters for the PID. Um, so that's, um, I mean, all, this stuff is, yeah, I guess requires a little more study to really understand, but I'm not sure that there'll always be a clean answer one way or another. Uh, so here's just a, a video of the, with the machine learning. So they're going one way, then they're directed as to um, switch direction there. Okay, and for that, I'd like to thank all, uh, all my collaborators. Um, so Marco does all the bioelectronic devices, um, Mircha, the, the devices for um, the imaging and basically all the hardware. Um, and then our, we we're also work with Min, um, Min and Rivka. Rivka's a head clinician and Min is um, professor in dermatology and Michael, who's a developmental biologist. And of course, all, all my, um, uh, the grad students that work with me, um, former master students, research scientists, postdocs. Um, so it's it's obviously taken a lot of people to to get these things together and integrated. Okay, so hopefully I didn't go too much over time. And then I'll um, so this is our a summary of our breakout session, and we had three primary topics. Um, so topic topic one was. You know, what the challenge was, um, the question posed was challenges in generating predictive models for biological systems slows the design of complex systems. So can robust control be used to engineer system response without a predictive mechanistic model? So essentially, can we bypass the need to build predictive models through the simple integration of, of um, 
of, of control of uh, controllers, such as the machine learning controller. Um, topic two, challenges in monitoring biological response in real time and effective time scales, limits intervention strategies. Is this a hard constraint? And so, as I mentioned, we were very limited in what we can measure in the wound healing. Um, as of now, we just have RGB images of the wound. Um, but, you know, there are other technologies and bioelectronic devices that measure other things. Um, so uh, that that is something that 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 is super essential to applying feedback to any system is being able to measure out system response and to actuate um, and to actuate the systems. And topic three, are there additional barriers that have not been addressed? And so I'll quickly um, summarize the topic one. The major themes that emerged, so I know I won't do the discussion justice because there was a lot of things that we talked about um, and, I, and I tried to highlight um, the, the main things that, that came out. So I apologize if, to anybody who was there and if I didn't uh, touch on any of your comments. Um, so the bottleneck to even begin to think about a robust control uh, re really remains at the lack of methods, tools to accelerate the development of predictive models. Um, I can also extrapolate behavior when the context changes. Um, and that's one of the most important added um, caveats to that. Um, so really like we couldn't even think about talking about control. We were just stuck at predictive models. Like how do we get a predictive model? Um, and that has really, cause it's like neural network based controller that I use. It's fine for like these single cell systems where you know, the input to output response is, is very simplistic and well understood. But scaling up to complex systems, um, you know, that doesn't that doesn't fly anymore, right? We really do need some sort of models. Um, so we need advanced modeling methods, leveraging data and prior knowledge. Um, somebody, you know, some various people brought up pins, physics informed neural networks, um, black box approaches to control, such as adaptive control, leveraging machine learning was considered. Um, but cannot be achieved without sufficiently rich spatial temporal information. So the other the other thing that is lacking, if we do a data driven approach, is uh, we need a lot of data, and that's a somewhere where we need to figure out how to meet in the middle. And this leads us to the next topic regarding sensing and actuation, which is you know the sensing part is where we would get our data. So in general, it's agreed that sensors are needed at various spatial temporal scales. Uh, but also we just need to get creative about what can serve as a sensor and develop data-driven methods to combine all that information. Um, and to understand where focus our efforts in advancing sensor technology, we must understand more about information processing. And so some people have brought up some really good points. So there are systems where dynamics at fast time scales in short intervals can influence long-term system response. And we see this in development and stem cell differentiation. Um, so that's something that we'd have to understand and know a priori uh, before we start to think about uh, where we really need to, to advance our efforts. Um, translation of single cell in vitro studies. Um, so there is a lot of technology we've seen already from the previous presentations for sensing and actuation at the single cell level, right, in vitro studies. But what does that mean for translation to animals and to human models? And uh, finally, breakout topic three are there additional barriers. So, so, get, so leading on that, it's important to consider when work is translational. Um, animal model is not good enough to mimic a human. So when is animal work translational and for what studies? And the same question we pose for organoids. And then, uh, you know, for fun, we've, we had like a subject area that was just like, what is, do we deem flat out impossible? Um, and so, uh, some of the answers were predictive models for microbiota, um, predicting mutations, evolution, and their consequences, uh, bottom-up predictive mechanistic models of complex systems. And finally, uh, just a, a list of, of, of um, participant inputs on what are the topics most critical to address. Um, the potential risk of bioengineered cells, biocontainment, leaks or potentially safety issues, how to address biological variability in addition to the environmental variability, mapping biological outcomes to mathematical frameworks for control targets, finding the right level of abstractions for modeling. And, and the final one is like, what is a barrier to use control theory in biology? You know, is it just that it's computational intensive? 
um, why have we not been able to advance the application of control theory to complex systems? So I'll wrap that up with the summary. Uh, context is key. There's a need to overcome barriers to accelerate predictive model, model development. Um, creativity is needed developing sensors and actuators that can handle perturbations across biological time scales. And developing appropriate translational models for the right applications is an evolving area of interest. Bridging disparate fields at the convergence of synthetic biology and control theory. So we talked a little bit about how do we get uh, purely computational people to communicate more with purely experimental people um, and bridge those gaps. Because sometimes there was a comment that sometimes the computational people don't have the right uh, domain expertise. And so with that, I, I wrap it up. Um, I guess with five minutes left for, for Q&A. Um, so at this time, thank you for your attention. And yeah, we'll take any questions. Yeah, we'll we'll wait to see if any uh, questions pop up in the chat. Um, I had one. the The graph that you um, posted for the um, the long term what what was the cycle of when you were turning it on versus turning it off? the The ten hour uh, example that you gave. Oh, um, let me see. That looks like about an hour on an hour off uh okay so it was turned on for an hour and then turned off for an hour okay that's correct yeah Dramat, andrew has a question hey marcella hi uh, cool talk um also interesting uh breakout summary of the breakout discussion. Um, obviously, this work uh, is focused on, you know, bioelectronics and the use of like physical systems interfacing with um, cells. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts and opinion on, you know, what is the pros and cons of utilizing these bioelectronic systems versus cell-based sensing and actuation mechanisms and you know in a in a kind of theoretical future what what's the optimal balance between the two um i think they can both be used i think right now the, the reason we reverted to this is because for um, just thinking about translational work in clinical settings and the fact that we're not going to like genetically manipulate the, the humans or put genetically manipulated cells into them because uh, just you know, FDA reg regulations and and getting past that and getting the right approvals. I mean, we're just not there technology wise. Um, but also, this can be you can think about combining with genetically engineered cells. So essentially, saying that we don't have to make those genetically engineered cells perfect because we can maybe couple it with also some external sensing and regulation mechanisms as well. Um, another potential uh, way forward is to. Essentially, if we use the external loop approach to control a system, can we actually then use that information to infer something about um, what is the sort of like feedback loop that is happening um, in the larger context? So say, say we take out like a module of a smaller gen, you know, gene network or, or biological network in, in the human body, um, but we take it out of the context of the human body. Can we learn something about how the how the the human body is you know interfacing with this module um, just by looking at how maybe a, a controller that achieves the same response um, might be working? If that makes sense. So maybe we can mm -hmm. achieve some interpretability there. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Okay, and we have one in the chat. Um, great presentation. How do you weight using and tweaking the endogenous machinery of cells versus designing? orthogonal pathways to control cellular systems. How do you weigh using to? Um, yeah, I don't know if I touched on that right now with my with my um, with my answer to the last question, or if there's something more <laughs> that I'm trying to get out of, of the question. Um, I, I mean, I think it's also ap just application oriented. Um, 
I, I can't like if you think about you're trying to control a system that like you know in in a human like a large complex system um through through regulating you know a finite set of genetic pathways um yeah i'm not sure because the, the one question is like the, i feel like the approaches are from two different extremes one is like the symbio approach is really like uh building up from the bottom up but also can be integrated into larger systems but obviously there's a big question mark about how that interfaces um in the context of an animal model for example um and the other one is a very like top-down approach and in this case it's like well okay we don't necessarily need to understand everything whereas the symbio you're really understanding everything as you're moving from the bottom up um, but the top-down approach is really like we just want results and outcomes and then learn on the way so it's a more in I, more like a translational practical engineering approach maybe Hey, thank you, Marcellus, for, for a great talk. So um, what I'll do now is introduce uh, Dr. Dave Rampula from NIB, IB's Discovery Science and Technology Division for our uh, closing comments. So Dave, over to you. Hey, Jermont, thanks so much. Um, and also, uh, I guess, you know, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, it's great to see a lot of familiar names and it's also great to see a lot of new names. Um, I hope it means that the community is maintaining its interest in the NIH and hopefully uh, growing too. So um, so if you just give me a minute here, I just have a couple slides that I can share with everyone. There we go. I think that's working. So, um, yeah, you know, this morning we heard uh, Dina talk a little bit about uh, NCI's early days with some of its workshops at the intersection of synthetic biology and cancer, um, and she uh, and she took us all the way up to about 2016. Um, and no doubt, NCI was a, a pioneer um, in synthetic biology at the NIH. Um, but then uh, 2017 rolled around. And uh, NIBIB had the idea to um, really make a, a push, uh, a real concerted effort to, to bring synthetic biology into the NIH um, a bit more than it already had been. And so um, I share the slide with you uh, that was presented back in 2017. Um, pretty basic, right? Uh, there was a couple other slides in this presentation too, but um, you know, this is where we, we really started to see um, a home, especially through the engineering lens. Um, and, uh, and, and this is why NIBIB really wanted to embrace it. Um, and I think uh, what you heard here today uh, is that um, there can be a real undercurrent of serious engineering principles uh, that can drive synthetic biology. Um, and I personally believe that those next generation cell-based therapies and diagnostics are gonna be dependent on our ability to really control them uh, at a new level than what we're really already capable of doing. Um, so again, thanks to everyone for being a part of this uh, workshop. Um, but you know, back in 2017, what we saw was uh, a lot of new investigators looking for a home. And I, I, really, I really think we did that, um, not just at the NIBIB, but you know, even, even beyond uh, and the rest of the NIH. And so um, what came out of that uh, council meeting was uh, a funding opportunity called Synthetic Biology for Engineering Applications. Um, we were joined by NCI and NCCIH, uh, who were the great early adopters of synthetic biology. Um, in particular, I don't know if he's still on the call, but Jerry Lee was a really big part of that, um, and no doubt uh, a big proponent of synthetic biology uh, uh, in the early days of, of NCI too, uh, that Dina was talking about. Um, and you know, it was it was a, a good little funding opportunity, really focused on tools and technology and their applications. Um, and it was reasonably robust, and I think overall pretty successful. Um, but then, uh, in that time, while that was out, the the synthetic biology community really kept growing inside the walls of the NIH. And um, uh, you know, we we group, you know, we had more conversations and more collaborations and connections were being formed. 
And then when the old funding opportunity uh, expired, we replaced it with a notice of special interest. And you'll see that in addition to the first three, uh, we added five more institutes uh, onto this list of institutes and centers that were interested in synthetic biology, uh, in particular for their application space. And, um, and we expanded it out too. It wasn't just for um, tools and technologies for you know, more therapies. And you know, we also really tried to call out that it's important for um, understanding basic and fundamental biological knowledge, uh, which I think came up a couple of times today uh, from our four speakers. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, our, our footprint has grown. I believe it is robust, which is maybe the word of the day. Um, and, uh, and then even beyond this NOCI, um, Dina also mentioned that um, collaborative approach for uh, engineering biology for cancer applications, um, which is a, a cooperative um, agreement. Uh, and th they were highlighted last year, uh, last year's meeting. So, um, so just a reminder too, to all of you that this notice is still out there. And there are a lot of institutes and centers that are really interested in hearing from you um, about your synthetic biology innovation. Um, another great thing that came out of all this collaboration and communication within the NIH is we started this annual meeting and we did it back in 2019 and we did it again in 2021, certainly with a gap in 2020. Um, then again, here in 2022. Um, and, and again, it doesn't work unless you all come and show up and participate. And there's been a really great conversation today. Um, and so, it, yeah, thanks again. And so I guess I wanted to also mention that you know, with the best of luck, I hope we can have the 2023 meeting um, in person on the NIH campus. Um, you know, of course it's TBD, but we've already reserved the space. So, um, you know, maybe make yourself a little save the date card and, and maybe we can uh, do this again in person. Uh, for those of you that were there in 2019, it was really great. Um, it was a really great interactive meeting, a lot of conversations in the hallways, a lot of conversations in the breakout rooms. Um, and so hopefully we can duplicate that again. Um, also, you'll see that um, there's some really beautiful windows there and um, that's where we have the poster session. So it's a really cool uh, place for an in-person poster session. Um, and I do invite you to actually attend the virtual one. So um, yeah, if you can, please do uh, click into Gather Town and move your little avatar around and, and see what's going on in the poster session. In addition to, um, some other NIHICs are gonna be there too, and, and with a, a table, uh, so to speak, and you can go and interact with um, people within the NIH too. And so, um, and the, the last thing I wanted to say was, um, again, thank you. Um, you know, in particular, Dina and Domitila and, and Katie, Josh and Marcella for participating in the breakouts and to my NIH colleagues who were there co-leading them. Um, uh, it really kind of put everything together and it seemed like it was a really great discussion. Um, and then um, I wanted to thank Infinity for uh, helping us put on this and run this whole show. Uh, Germont has done a great job uh, coming in and picking up the, the Symbio meeting on short notice and running with it. And, and now he's adopting the uh, NIBIB synthetic biology portfolio. So um, many of you have been interacting with him. Uh, and lastly, um, I just wanted to make a very special thank you to Julia Ringel, who um, a lot of you probably have interacted with over the last four odd years uh, when it comes to this meeting. Um, she has been indispensable and it totally wouldn't exist without her, um, but she's moving on to bigger and better things still within the NIBIB, uh, but her passion is in more data analytics. And so she's moving away from um, put, helping us put on this um, uh, workshop. Um, so she will be missed, but not forgotten. Um, and so, you know, if there's a virtual applause out there, um, you know, so thank you so much, Julia, for all your years of service uh, for this synthetic biology meeting. So um, that's really all I've got here. Um, I guess uh, I'll turn this back over to Jermont or Infinity. Um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Okay, so we're going to um, have our virtual poster session and networking session in Gathertown. You can uh, see the link that um, Infinity just put in our chat. And it's also in uh, the email that they sent for all the participants. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers, all the co-leads and all the participants. This is a great meeting and um, we hope to see you in Gathertown and we'll uh, see you next year. <laughs>